Majority Report with Sam Cedar. The destiny of America is always safer in the hands of the people than in the conference rooms of any elite. Sam Cedar. They are unanimous in their hate for me, and I welcome their hatred. We must guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence, whether sought or unsought, by the military-industrial complex. The Majority Report with Sam Cedar. <laughs> And I get the feeling you've been cheated. It is Monday, March 11th, 2019. My name is Sam Cedar. This is the five-time award-winning Majority Report. We are broadcasting live steps from the industrially ravaged Gowanus Canal in the heartland of America, downtown Brooklyn, USA. On the program today... Jonathan H. Marks, director of the bioethics program at Penn State University, also an affiliate faculty with Penn State Law and School of International Affairs on the perils of partnership, industry influence, institutional integrity, and public health. Also on the program today, Trump's uh, domestic slashing Pentagon pumping budget will never be law. But it is a nice summation of his and Republican policies. Meanwhile, Tucker Carlson in the barrel and unbowed. Dems will pass legislation in the House to make D.C. the 51st state and send to the Senate where Mitt, uh, I imagine McConnell will shut it down. Do the same thing for Puerto Rico or Independence. Okay, I will. Day four of blackouts in Venezuela, if only Puerto Rico had such coverage. Meanwhile, video uh, released debunks the aid convoy story that even our vice president was pushing. Huh. They don't Even have, Mike Pence? They don't have video in the White House. New reports on a, an imminent North Korea missile launch. So much for all that. And in the guise of, over, of expanding overtime pay, Trump rolls back Obama's overtime plan, which would have raised overtime or given overtime to 12 million Americans. New release to show Trump's DOJ actually contemplated launching a Uranium One investigation. 157 die in an Ethiopian air crash. But it's Boeing's fault. Piers Boeing has a problem. And the Iowa Supreme Court rules against Iowa's trans people Medicaid ban. Good for that court. All this and more on today's program, ladies and gentlemen. Yes, it is another week. Uh, we're 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 in March. We it, it is getting. Uh, we're now in um, a spring uh, daylight savings time, and uh, apparently uh, Donald Trump had some comment about. It. I don't really care, but I did find it fascinating that Brendan my son does, slept in uh, this morning by about fifteen twenty minutes. Like he like he still. Um, you know, sort of on uh, on the old time. I mean, same, same issue. The hour, the, the hour, it killed me this weekend. It was not my two birthday parties. It was that one hour taken away from me. Deadly. He also had a birthday party. Uh, so uh, you guys, you're you're basically living life. Uh, and um, uh, we are now. We are in mid March almost, and we are only uh about three months away from the first Democratic uh, primary debate, maybe a little bit less, actually. So um, this is where we're headed, and um, it, it should be interesting. And uh, here is an example of what won't be terribly interesting, although I think maybe this is, I, I mean, it is, I, you know, I've said this for some time, but it really is amazing and, and we, we're going to have to wait and see 
um, you know, what happens, and hopefully uh, after 2020 we'll be able to test this proposition, when we have a uh, the Democrats having governmental control of both houses and the uh, presidency, we, we're not living in an era, I think, where uh, having the House and the presidency is necessarily uh, going to help. Um, and we saw this in the last term, I think, of Obama, where at the very least the rhetoric changed in the Senate and in the House caucuses to a certain extent. We saw the expansion of Social Security uh, being voted on in a res non-binding resolution, of course. Um, but we saw all the caucus members in the Senate vote to expand Social Security, a dramatic turn from where we were just seven, eight years later, or earlier, I should say. Um, and in the Democratic Party, the rhetoric, at least, like I say, we've yet to see, uh, but, you know, today, maybe I think it's today or tomorrow, we will see the House vote to um, make uh, D.C. the 51st state. Um, the rhetoric has not only um, become more partisan, less uh, deferential by, uh, by Democrats, not across the board, but just but broadly. Um, and uh, also uh, to the left, to the extent that the sort of moderate conservative who jumps in the race when he goes on Morning Joe, John Hickenlooper, the, uh, the, the champion of, of fracking, is afraid to say he's capitalist. Here is uh, John Hickenlooper with Joe Scarborough. This is pretty funny. And it really is getting people together, getting them to lay down their weapons, and then getting stuff done. And the labels, right. I think most Democrats don't care as much about the labels. Go well, would you, call yourself, would you call yourself a proud capitalist? <laughs> oh, I don't know. I, you know, again, the labels, I'm not sure uh, any of them fit. But I do believe that, you know, that ability to look at, you know, climate change and figure out how are we really going to create a sense of urgency and get people together. What we right. did with methane, methane is one of the worst climate pollutants that there is. Right. And, you know, we're the first state and so far the only state to really address it aggressively. Right. Let me ask you, just I'll, I'll break it down even more. Do you consider yourself a capitalist? Well, again, the labels, you know, I'm a small business person. So uh, <laughs> that part of the system that you would call capitalist, I get it. I understand it. Uh, what? I worked very hard. You know, when you open your own business, you know, when we first signed the lease in lower downtown Denver to build our brew pub, it was one dollar per square foot per year. I mean, that right. is if you haven't ever signed one of those leases, that is a, that rent is almost free. And it reflects how bad and how abandoned that part of the, of the community was. We worked right. 70, 80, 90 hours a week wow. to build the business. And we worked with the other business yeah. owners in lower down to help them build their business. Is that capitalism? I guess. I mean, sure. <laughs> so in that sense of building community, uh, that's one way to do it. One aspect of it. It's not all that it is, right? I served on 42 right. nonprofit boards and committees in that same 12 year period. Right. Well, so, so uh, uh, do you consider yourself a capitalist and does capitalism <laughs> work? <laughs> well, I think. Fonzie, I, wait a second. It's just like they're both so confused here. They're both like, wait a second, what? He's got to ask this question three times. Like, he's literally getting, like, I, there's no doubt in my mind that the producer's going, wait, Joe, ask him, why won't he answer that question? That's, the, it's, that's supposed to be the softball question, right? Wait, just go back a little bit. It's so funny because, like, it, it really is, it is, it, it, it's almost as if uh, Hickenlooper was just, like, going, like, um, what's the question? Oh, I'm sorry. Just looking at some polling here. What, what is the, like, he clearly has seen there has been some internal poll where they basically just said, hey, um, nobody's ever going to ask you this, but just don't say you're a proud capitalist. And then just coincidentally, he gets asked it. And they're both just completely confused as to why they're having this conversation. Continue. Boards and committees in that same 12 year period. Right. Well, so, so uh, uh, do you consider yourself a capitalist and does capitalism work? Well, I think I, I, I don't look at myself with a label. Uh, 
And I certainly think that small business is part of the solution. Uh, I think right now, the way capitalism is working in the United States, it's not doing what it once did. It's not, it's really not providing security and opportunity for the middle class and for poor people. Wow. I wow. just love that. that. Just, it's just the same disingenuousness. A couple of years ago, that guy was talking to a progressive audience and people were trying to get him to commit to probably even really minimal things because his record as governor of Colorado is quite conservative. And he was probably like, well, you know, if you want to call that progressive, create an opportunity for right, people. Exactly. And now he's doing the same hey, nonsense to if, Joe Scarborough's capitalism if, propaganda. If expanding Social Security and providing single payer health care insurance to every American is capitalism. Sure, I'm a capitalist then. If tracking to Nicaragua to have solidarity with the Sandinistas makes me a capitalist, then I don't flinch from that label, Joe. If, if listen, if if nationalizing uh, the refining capacity of the United States as well as the banks is capitalism, then I'm a capitalist, Joe. If, if holding the criminal <laughs> CEOs of fossil fuel companies accountable while nationalizing their assets makes me pro-free market, then you know I certainly wouldn't flinch from that label, Joe. I think we need to come together. Common right. sense solutions, um, public-private partnerships, re-education camps, <laughs> t- teaching people uh, a new set of uh, way of doing things is capitalism. That shoe fits. Sending Don Jr. to do a little <laughs> bit of manual labor because he's part uh, of the bourgeoisie class that has destroyed not only this pl- country but the entire planet makes me a capitalist, Joe. Then I, then sure, I think we get too fixated I, on labels. That's just fascinating to me. But I mean, to, to you know, that is just um, that is polling. That is polling. Just like internal polling. Just you know, the bones are showing a little bit too much there. Uh, this does seem like a good chance to put out some sort of PSA to define uh, what a capitalist actually is which is not nearly as subjective as they're making it out to be in this clip, right? Like a capitalist is a boss or a property owner who, uh, you know, makes money off of the working class. So he, he did answer the question, like really, in several different ways when he's like, yes, I, well, I am a small business owner. Like, yes. So, so the answer is yes, you are a capitalist. Yeah, I mean, I think it was pretty obvious. Um, I mean, that he is. He's just, he won't. He won't. Uh, He's trying to pull to at three percent instead of 05 percent. Right. He's got to get into that uh, debate. I, I just love the idea of like within ten seconds of being asked if you're a capitalist, you're talking about controlling methane. I was. All, I just so hope that Marianne Williamson and Andrew <laughs> Yang are on that stage and not John Hickenlooper. Uh, Folks, every two seconds, there is a new victim of identity theft, which means a criminal could be spending your money, applying for loans in your name, even damaging your credit, the good credit you've worked so hard to build. Unfortunately, you can miss certain threats to your identity by just checking bank statements and monitoring your credit. Good thing there's LifeLock Identity Theft Protection. LifeLock uses proprietary technology to detect and alert you to a wide range of identity threats like your social security number for sale on the dark web, for example. And if you do have an issue uh, involving identity theft, one of LifeLock's identity restoration specialists will work to fix it. Of course, no one can prevent all identity theft or monitor all transactions at all businesses. But with LifeLock, you get ide- LifeLock, you get identity theft protection and additional features to help protect you, your devices against cyber threats for as low as nine ninety nine a month. I uh, I signed up for some new service at National Grid the other day, or Con Ed. I can't remember which one it was. And I got, I got pinged. They they sent me a text. Just want you to know that somebody's opened up an account in your name. I was like, thank you. It was, it was helpful. Uh, I was impressed by that. Don't waste another second, folks. Visit lifelock.com slash majority now to save 10% on your first year. That's lifelock.com slash majority for 10% off. Lifelock.com slash majority majority also uh folks as you know stress is a worldwide epidemic we're working longer hours we're inundated with the constant news cycle we're more connected than ever before i I feel like that that notion of stress is completely indistinguishable from my life i would say 
That's why we're partnering with Calm. It's the number one app to help reduce your anxiety and stress and help you sleep better. There are more than 40 million people around the world who have downloaded it now. If you head to calm.com slash majority, you'll get 25% off a Calm premium subscription, which includes guided meditations on issues like anxiety, stress, and focus, including a brand new meditation each day. Sleep stories. Which are my, which are, I was going to say my bedtime stories, but they are bedtime stories for adults designed to help you relax. Head to the magical lavender fields of southern France with Stephen Fry. Oh no! <laughs> Stop hurting me, Mister. I can Fry. hear about it as long as it's not, uh, it's not as long, not smell. It's like it I can hear about it. Uh, or explore the moonlit jungles of Africa with Leona Lewis. They also Happy have days. soothing music and more. Right now, Majority Report listeners get 25% off a Calm premium subscription at calm.com slash majority. That's calm, C-A-L-M dot com slash majority. Get unlimited access to all of Calm's content today at calm.com slash majority. Get calm and stop stressing. All right, we're going to take a quick break. When we come back, we'll be talking to Jonathan H. Marks about the perils of partnership, industry influence, institutional integrity, and public health. We are back. Sam Cedar on the Majority Report. Just a reminder, you can support this program by going to jointhemajorityreport.com. You get to hear uh, all the, uh, uh, the extra content in the fun half. In the meantime, I want to welcome to the program the author of The Perils of Partnership, Industry, Influence, Institutional Integrity, and Public Health. He's the director of the Bioethics Program at Penn State University, also affiliate faculty with Penn State Law and School of International Affairs. Jonathan H. Marks, welcome to the program. Thank you so much for having me. So um, we're talking specifically about public-private uh, partnerships. Um, we have heard about these, I think, for um, you know quite a while in the context of, uh, you know, uh, I guess may maybe most often in sort of like localized uh, development, if you will. What, when did... The uh, when did we start to see more of this in the context of public health? So that's a great question. I grew up in Britain, and um, we have Margaret Thatcher to thank for PFIs, as she called them, private finance initiatives, which were in sort of in the infrastructure sector. But um, in recent years, in the last, uh, especially in the last decade or so, there have been a proliferation of public-private partnerships in the context of public health and usually with corporate actors who are responsible for either creating or exacerbating the very public health problem that the governments are trying to solve. So, for example, partnering with the soda industry to address obesity. Well, uh, let's, I, I want to go into uh, some of the, uh, the, the, the detail, I mean, some of the specifics. You do a lot of case studies here. Um, and... Uh, ultimately, you introduce uh, the um, the principle of uh, of separation of powers in some respects, um, and also, I guess, maybe what we would contemplate in terms of like antitrust on, on some level. But um, let's uh, let's start with with some of the, the you know you mentioned sodas and obesity, but let's let's talk about a couple of 
the uh, the the case studies that you talk about. Um, the the idea of uh, the U.S. working with fast food companies um, to increase the amount of cheese that they offer. Yeah, so that's a that's a great example, and I do want to come back to the arguments I make about separation of powers yes. and antitrust because I think the argument I'm making is essentially that whatever your politics, you should care about corporate influence, and I'll come back to that. But the example you give is a is a great one. Um, this is it led to the headline in the New York Times, um, you know, while warning about fat, U.S. pushes cheese sales. So essentially. Um, there was a surfeit of cheese in the market, and um, the government basically uh, went to uh, what at that time was the least well-performing pizza chain and said, hey, you're not doing very well. We can help you out. How about um, getting some more cheese into your pizzas? And voila, the stuffed cheese crust pizza was born. Not because Americans were clamoring for it, but because this was a great way of offloading a ton of cheese that was not being sold. Uh, I, 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 that story is just so nuts to me. Uh, but, but, but so, okay, well, first off, let's just back up. What, why was there a, a surplus of cheese? Why is that the business of the United States government? Well, so we have a, um, a U.S. Department of Agriculture that has what is essentially a conflicting mission. So on the one hand, it's trying to promote the interests of agribusiness. And on the other hand, it's also in the business of offering um, dietary guidance um, in collaboration with Health and Human Services. And so these two things conflict. Obviously, um, if Americans are paying some attention to the warnings about consuming too much fat and they don't buy cheese, that um, serves the, um, the sort of dietary guidance aim. But uh, agribusiness is obviously upset because it has a ton of cheese it can't shift. And so what um, the U.S. Department of Agriculture, and this was, um, by the way, under uh, uh, under Obama as well as Bush, what they did was they basically signed off on these collaborative arrangements um, designed to offload a bunch of cheese onto the domestic market. How does the collaboration work? Is it just sort of like we're going to sit in a room with you and we can uh, we're going to bring in some of the greatest thinkers? We're going to come up with a uh, concept where we put cheese into the uh, dough, or is it? I mean, what what does what does the actual collaboration in that context look like? So I, uh, my understanding, just from the documents in the public domain, I mean, I wasn't obviously in the room, is that, yes, it does involve people sitting around um, a boardroom um, and trying to figure this thing out together, public and private. And in fact, um, the, the sort of go-between between the U.S. Department of Agriculture and the food companies was Dairy Management Incorporated, which is actually a creature created by federal statute. And it's sort of funded by the dairy checkoff program. So it gets money from agribusiness. And basically what they did is they sat down and worked with these fast food companies. And in fact, they boasted that they had worked with Taco Bell to produce a menu item that contained eight times as much cheese as the average menu item that that fast food company was offering. Um, I mean, that just sounds like... I mean, this is almost the, the the problem is even beyond right the public partner uh, the the public private partnership or is it is it because of the 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 relationship from the of the regulatory agency or I guess I guess that's what you would call it um, th there's just too close of a of a relationship or is it just simply poor um, development of of bureaucratic structure that you would have an agency that is so conflicted. So I do think that if you were starting from scratch, you would not um, have an agency like the USDA with this internally conflicting mission. I think that is a, a profound problem. Um, but I also think that this is not an, I, this may be a particularly egregious example, but it's not an isolated example. It's part of a widespread and systemic practice. Um, not just in the U.S., but in other countries, too, of governments and public health agencies getting together with industry to solve major public health problems, whether it be obesity or um, the opioid epidemic, for example, on the one hand, or cancer and climate change, to give you two other examples. The, essentially, this has become the way 
we um, solve problems. And as I say in the book, it's become the water that policymakers have learned to swim in. They no longer see it anymore. And part of the challenge of the book is to try and get people to realize that this is problematic, irrespective of where you are in the political spectrum. Uh, you mentioned that it's an international problem. And um, let's talk about the United Nations. Um, um, uh they're um, they're uh, partnering uh, to deal with sustainability. Uh, they're partnering with Coca Cola when it comes to uh, to to uh, to India. Yeah. So they had an initiative. Um, the UN Habitat Program had an initiative called the Support My School Initiative, and the aims clearly. Um, are ones that most people would endorse. There's a problem with sanitation in schools in rural India. It's a gender equity issue. When there's poor sanitation, the girls drop out before the boys. So certainly you'd want to do something about improving sanitation. But they partnered with Coca-Cola in a, you know, a, a months and years long campaign with you know 12 hour telethons with the Coca-Cola logo emblazoned all over the place. I mean, you couldn't pay for that kind of advertising, or indeed it would cost you a lot more. And what Coca-Cola got in return for a relatively small investment um, was a lot of positive media coverage, burnishing the reputation of the company and promoting um, the sale of its products including um, its leading brands, which play a major role in um, uh, the obesity epidemic. And as I argue in the book, the UN program's mission is to promote sustainable living. But by promoting the consumption of sugar-sweetened beverages made from scarce local water and sold in plastic bottles, that is neither sustainable from an environmental nor a public health point of view. Um, let's talk a little bit about um, uh, industry, industry uh, partnership with, with research universities. I mean, give us an example of what, what is um, problematic with, with, with those relationships. So I think a lot of people get very anxious when they hear about um, the big high-profile partnerships involving Novartis or Monsanto, and there have been a number of those kinds of partnerships. But I think what they fail to recognize is that even smaller arrangements with lots of little different corporate actors can have a distorting effect on research that gets done. We know from a bunch of empirical studies that industry-funded or industry-sponsored research produces not only findings that are more favorable to the corporate sponsors, but also interpretations of those findings that are vastly more favorable to the corporate sponsors. But the additional point I make in the book is that we fail to recognize the ways in which these corporate partnerships and industry funding more broadly shapes the kinds of questions that get asked and answered, as well as how they get asked and answered. And if you take um, an example from the sort of uh, the cancer world, everybody benefits from doing lots of work on new cancer therapies that may add a few months to someone's life. And I would be the last to say we shouldn't do that research. But the kind of research that doesn't get done because of all these corporate partnerships or gets done to a far lesser degree are causes and prevention research because that kind of research would call into question the role of a huge number of corporations' products in cancer. So, for example, you see makeup companies sponsoring and supporting charities that do work on treatment and, and, so, and cure, but not on causes and prevention, because then you might have to ask the question, to what extent do makeup products contribute to cancer? So this is an important way in which um, uh, industry money works. It influences questions, and not surprisingly so. Corporations don't want scientists to look at questions that might hurt their bottom line. And, 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 it, and I mean, it influences questions not necessarily by um, by editorializing, but by simply just providing um, by uh, you know keeping people busy, right? I mean, it's yeah, just like it's, there's there's only so many uh, questions you can ask, and if someone's paying you to ask the questions, uh, they may seem innocuous questions, but they're preventing you from examining other questions. 
Exactly right. They tend to crowd out the other questions. If you have if all this money floods in for you to look at questions that either promote the interests of industry or are not threatening to the interests of industry, those are the questions you'll explore and you'll neglect the other ones. But what I say in the book is if we're really serious about addressing problems like obesity, the opioid epidemic, like cancer or climate change, we have to be able to look at all potential solutions, including those that are threatening to the bottom line of powerful corporations. Uh, you know, I mean, that, that dynamic uh, just is reminiscent. I had a religious studies professor who was always like, look, you know, you can read any book you want about religion. Tell me what discipline the person comes from, and I will basically tell you what the book says, because their <laughs> primary question is going to start, is going to be different if they're a sociologist versus a psychiatrist, a psychologist or uh, you know, or a, uh, you know, uh, a political science person, they're all going to look at it from a different perspective. And in this instance, it's just money's perspective. So what, what I, since you talk about perspectives, what I really do want to emphasize is why people should care about this, irrespective of where they are in the political spectrum. Um, so I don't think corporate influence should be thought of as a partisan issue. I think everyone should care about it. And let me tell you why, right? We totally get that as between the branches of government, there should be some separation. We don't think it would be a great idea for the White House to sit down with the Supreme Court and figure out the next version of health care reform and the ways in which it, w it could be made compatible with the Constitution. Why don't we think that's a good idea? Because the Supreme Court has to hold the other branches of government accountable and it has to interpret the Constitution and it, can't, it has to interpret the laws and determine their constitutionality. It can't do those things if it's in bed with the other branches of government making the laws or otherwise. So we totally get the importance of separation of powers, separations between um, branches of government. We also totally get the importance of separation as between private bodies, right? We don't think it would be a good idea for two major airlines to get together and one of them agree to take the New York DC route while the other takes the New York Boston route because we'd end up paying more because there'd be no competition. It's also why we think price fixing is problematic. So we totally get the need for tension, struggle between the branches of government and tension or struggle among corporations for the market. So it, bearing in mind, we get the importance of public, public separation and private, private separation. Why is it that we think public and private getting together can solve our most pressing or wicked public health and environmental problems? And I argue that it can't and shouldn't. Uh, all right, uh, so let me play a little bit of devil's advocate here. Um, one being that there are actually political um, uh, ideologies that want to promote more corporate friendly solutions. And the um, and, you know, there there are different there are competing views on what antitrust should actually be. Um, you know, different schools of thought. In fact, that's starting to play out now in our politics as well. Um, the uh, the this this concept of there being a conflict of interest there. It seems to me there's a significant percentage of the country that thinks that government at the very least, I mean, or at the most should be a conduit to creating more opportunities for corporate America. So a couple of things. First, um, my argument is not premised on the notion that government is inherently good and corporations are inherently bad. Both is equally capable of good or ill, as we know in this very moment. Um, and while I agree that there may be disagreements about the boundaries of antitrust, disagreements about um, to what extent governments should be supporting the work of corporations, governments are primarily the guarantors of the public good. And that, to me, is something I think which everyone should understand. After all, Republicans and Democrats alike breathe air, drink water, all those things we should be concerned about protecting. And um, corporations should complain about what regulators do, just as regulators should critique 
and regulate corporations' activities. That should, in an ideal world, be a, re a relationship of tension and sometimes direct conflict. Conflict isn't inherently bad. Conflict between um, opposing sides in a legal case is what should give rise to a just result. Conflict between regulators and um, the regulated is what we should be aiming for. Uh, what do you say to someone who would say, well, OK, uh, it may be the case that, um, you know, uh, some uh, makeup company is, is funding the cancer research and therefore um, in a vacuum of, of corporations funding research about cancer, maybe maybe these uh, cancer researchers would ask questions that lead them to find that some of these corporations products are problematic. But that presumes that there's going to be money there like how do uh, what do we need to do uh, when when we hear about public private partnerships um, isn't the only way to ultimately um, get rid of this conflict of interest is to simply have uh, public financing for these uh, for these things so I think public financing is really important. It, it's, it doesn't eliminate other concerns, right? So clearly one can have politicization. But yes, I would argue we need public funding. And what I would argue is before we can even have that conversation, what the leaders of public health agencies need to do and what the administrators of universities need to do, among others, is they need to stop touting these public-private partnerships with great celebration and then keeping their reservations quietly to themselves. We need to start having an open dialogue about why partnerships with industry and why corporate funding is problematic. And only once we've had that discussion can we get to the next stage of what are the solutions and is public funding part of a solution? And in my view, it is. Um, I think what, what, we're, what the situation we're in right now is one where we have this great public acclaim and all the celebration and the photographs and the holding the large blown up images of the checks of the corporate donation and then people going away and keeping their reservations to themselves. That, in my view, is the first thing that has to stop. Well, so how much of that do you think is going on, those like private uh, re reservations? I mean, I, I imagine maybe you bumped into that in the course of, uh, of doing research for this book. And I'm curious, what do you think is the... I mean, le let's explore that a little bit because that seems to me... Um, it's it, it, it at that point it's not a question of persuasion right it's a question of something else yeah so so i i have a goal in the in the book and in my work more broadly and one goal is to help some people who don't see these relationships as problematic to help some people understand why they are problematic the others who get that they're problematic but don't know quite how to articulate why, and my book is designed to help them articulate why. And then the third, a third audience is those who know they're problematic but don't know where to go next. And one of the things I would say is there is an opportunity for collective action here. If you are the dean of a school of public health, why not get together with 10 other deans of the school of public health and write an open letter in the New York Times saying, look, you are relying on us, the academy, to provide solutions to problems like cancer, opioids, and obesity. But if we're going to be able to help you, we have to be able to look everywhere at all potential solutions, not just those that serve the interests of industry. And we can't do that without public funding. That will be the first step. I look forward to reading such a letter in the New York Times next week. Well, and so, but then what happens? I mean, you still have this like sort of uh, financial dilemma, right? Like, where is the funding? Aren't the uh, the members of those uh, the uh, alumni association of those schools going to come and say, okay, well, where are you getting the funding? So there are all sorts of potential models for funding, and. Um, you know, one of them, you know, there, I'm not saying this is the only one or necessarily the best one, but just off the top of my head, one possibility would be what if we um, created some method of assessing the role of a corporation's products in creating or exacerbating a public health crisis and tax them directly for that contribution to a public health crisis and use that money in order to fund research addressing the problem. That's one potential model. Another potential model is if corporations are going to require to garner a body of evidence in order to get FDA approval, for example, for their new drugs, is that they basically pay 
a, a government body, an intermediary, a licensing fee, and that research gets farmed out to other other bodies, other academic institutions. There are lots of different potential funding models. Some, uh, each has its pros and cons, but we will never get to that conversation until we start to talk about why what we have now is problematic. Um, do you see any... Uh, uh I guess awareness uh, beyond the that 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 is spoken in whispers. I guess in sort of in the universities, um, how much uh, how much has the I guess the environment changed in terms of how um, how aware people are of how uh, of how problematic this is, and I, and I, and this runs the gamut too, right? In terms of like even on some level like philanthropic stuff and um and 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 just a broad i mean you mentioned the opioid crisis the idea that the um uh that Purdue would sit down uh would even be invited to the table at any point to talk about what to do with the opioid crisis is um i don't know basically like inviting um you know the 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 serial killer to to ask like what's the best way to dispose of all these bodies or something um, so the first thing I would say in response to your first question is, are people aware? Here's what people are aware of, because this gets featured in mainstream media, including the New York Times. They're aware that individual researchers are not fully disclosing their financial relationships with drug companies and other major corporations in some cases, because those are high-profile cases. People get named and shamed. What the general public is not aware of is the broader systemic problem that arises from institutional relationships, from relationships not just involving individuals and corporations, but institutions, um, but relationships at the institutional level, governments, universities creating partnerships. That's the first problem I think they're they're not aware of. And you're right, the opioid um, the opioid uh, situation I think is deeply deeply problematic. In 2017, when the NIH launched an initiative to address the opioid crisis, it pulled together a number of pharmaceutical companies, including Purdue. Purdue, by the way, had pleaded guilty in 2007 to um, misleading physicians and patients about the addiction risks of OxyContin. And according to recent filings by the Attorney General of Massachusetts, those practices continued for another decade. So while the NIH was sitting down and talking to Purdue, among other companies, and while Purdue was running advertisements in the Wall Street Journal and the New York Times saying we are part of, we are going to be partners in the solution to the opioid crisis, <laughs> according, at the same time as all that, according to the filings in, in the court in Massachusetts, they were, the company was also developing plans to expand the opioid market. So again, this is the model. Let's partner with corporations, so the model says, even though they may have had a role in creating or exacerbating the crisis. And so they're essentially, in some respects, being rewarded. But I just want to emphasize that the problem goes beyond one individual corporation like, Far like Purdue. If governments partner with pharmaceutical companies to solve the opioid crisis, then not surprisingly, the kind of solutions we're going to get are more opioids or more painkillers, more analgesics. Now, maybe indeed we do need more painkillers, but we cannot neglect the other potential solutions to the opioid crisis. And my fear is that that's what will happen if partnership with um, the pharmaceutical sector become the paradigm in that case too. So, uh, so broadly speaking, you cannot sit down and develop uh, or even ask questions about a problem with um, with entities that have, in some level, a a profit motive to ask specific questions rather than to go in and find the answers. And it seems that I guess the other important uh, message is. That even in certain circumstances, when there is a net positive with a specific company, overall, if you open yourself up to this dynamic, it's a net negative for society. Yeah. So the first thing is, can you sit down? Well, there are open fora for the for um, governments to interact with the private sector. Think of um, corporations giving evidence before Congress or responding publicly to regulations about how they'll impact their business. That kind of arm's length expression of views in a public forum is not nearly as problematic as these secret behind uh, closed doors partnerships. But as to your second point, 
Absolutely. It is a mistake to focus on individual. I can point to why a particular individual partnership is especially egregious. For example, using a soda company's logos, blazoning them all over the television screen and promoting its products. That's problematic. But it's a mistake to say, as many people say to me, show me an ideal partnership and we'll model that. Because the problem with thinking about partnerships in isolation is you miss the cumulative and systemic distorting effects of these kinds of relationships relationships as a paradigm for solving problems in public health. The Perils of Partnership, Industry, Influence, Institutional Integrity, and Public Health. Jonathan H. Marks, thanks so much for your time today. Really appreciate it. We will put a link to your book at majority.fm. Thanks so much. It's been a pleasure. Bye-bye. All right, folks, there you have it. The data is in. Um, I hope people heard specifically that part about the um, uh, research that is paid for by corporations. Um, we get into this a lot with um, with all sorts of types of research. I don't want to bring it up and get all the emails, but um, the fact is, is that nobody. the The real problem is, it seems to me, and I think you know, uh, on a philosophical level, I think you know, to my perspective the professor might be a little bit more, a um, little bit less jaded about the, uh, the chances of convincing people of different ideologies of this dynamic. I think you have to start with, we got to provide funding. In the same way that this money crowds out other questions, you need to come in with money that crowds out this money. <laughs> and, uh, and maybe you also need to sort of create regulations that inhibit, make this money less attractive, more restricted, uh, and then come in with, with monies. I mean, and there are mechanisms in which to generate this. I mean, many of the drug patents that are developed, many uh, uh, all happen through public research and then end up getting pro privatized. So how about this? We... Um, socialize the cost of developing these things and instead of privatizing the profits we socialize the profits and we throw those back into more research and etc 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 but um there's the data folks so yeah i thought it was super interesting when he was talking about um, taxing corporations for the cost that you can calculate of the social problems that they cause because it's uh it's sort of an incremental position right because on the one hand, uh, if you have the political power to impose those kinds of taxes, it seems like you should use that to just, you know, get at the root of the problem and expropriate those corporations. On the other hand, it definitely it's convinces like people to think about it in a, a new way than the way a lot of people think about it now, which is that there's, you know, no connection and no responsibility. There may be a slight difference between the political power in, in causing companies to assume the responsibility for their externalities and, and being able to expropriate them. But I think there's probably a little bit more of a leap in terms of the, polit the political power that's involved in that. But the, the concept of making corporations pay for their externalities uh, we talk about all the time. I mean, the uh, if you factor in, never mind global warming, but the costs of um, of, of pollution to people's health, to uh, people's quality of life, to uh, potential for brain damage, for whatever it is, if you it, you know in selling products, in burning coal, in um, in, in in all of those factors. Um, these externalities would be uh, prohibitive to a lot of these businesses, frankly. Yeah. Uh, I mean, the problem then becomes like it's better to ask forgiveness than permission. You know, you can't undo some of the damage that they do to people. Like you can't uh, bring back people from the dead who've died of opiate overdoses. Right. You can't, uh, you can't fix some of the damage that's been done to the environment, et cetera. All right. We're going to take a quick break, head into the fun half. Uh, just a reminder, folks, this program relies on your support. You can become a member by going to jointhemajorityreport.com. When you do, we give you extra content every day. And uh, also, we give you uh, the free show free of uh, commercials and ads. 
Also, don't forget JustCoffee.coop, fair trade coffee, tea, or chocolate. Use the coupon code MAJORITY. Get 10% off. Not only is it great coffee, great company, uh, great cooperative company. Michael, today is Monday. That means, wait, what? Oh, yeah. Hey, how's it going? Weird. Thought uh, I'd stop by. <laughs> Uh, today is Monday. Obviously You're here. don't get used to it. Um, and uh, you will be here definitely tomorrow. Definitely. What's happening tomorrow? What's happening tomorrow is John Idarola is making his debut on TMBS. Looking forward to talk with him of the Damage Report and the Young Turks. And then uh, Joshua Khan, who's a friend of show, who is the executive director of Wildfire Project and an activist who's worked everywhere from the Philippines to Arpaios, Arizona is going to talk about the sort of ABCs of activism and uh, how we actually make change on a rent strike grassroots type of level. 7 o'clock, TMBS, patreon.com slash TMBS for the whole thing. And check us out on our YouTube channel where we will live stream it and now have plenty of clips. Make change, okay? What did you say? You said change. I know. I'm sorry. I, I have I have my throat is uh, all right. You don't have to just bad. I mean, I thought it was just like a hook. Um, so yeah, that's how uh, Limbaugh says it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yes, indeed. Boo. Yes, indeed. Hiss. <laughs> that's what we're going to be talking about with Joshua Khan. <laughs> Jamie, this week on the Drantifada, uh, we have an interview with Hamilton Nolan about labor organizing in the media and beyond. We are also releasing. A bonus, I believe, today, wherein we talk about electoral politics with Hamilton Nolan. I know we don't do that very often, so you got to pay to hear us talk about that. And uh, I'm very excited to be releasing soon some interviews that Andy did with uh, people from the caravan that's currently in Tijuana to share their stories. Matt? Yeah, Literary Hangover folks, uh, subscribe to it on YouTube or on your uh, podcast feed. We're doing King Philip's War uh, this weekend, so look forward to that. Quick break, 646-257-3920. See you in the fun half. Oh, wait, 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 whoa, 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 whoa. Whoa. Hey, Catch I want to just thanks again to LifeLock Identity Theft Protection for supporting today's show. Of course, no one can prevent all identity theft or monitor all transactions at all businesses. With LifeLock, you get identity theft protection and additional features to help protect your devices against cyber threats. For as low as $9.99 a month, don't waste another second. Visit LifeLock.com slash majority now to save 10% on your first year. That's lifelock.com slash majority for 10% off lifelock.com slash majority.
to that, Matt? Uh, that was someone called Grat de la Pat. Grat de la Pat, of course. That was a. I like that version. Yeah, that's good. We've had some good versions lately. Are people making new ones? I don't think so. I think we're still <laughs> working through the Jesus. back catalog. God. Call from a 702 area code. Who's this? Where are you calling from? Hey, Sam. It's Bro Flamingo from Las Vegas. Bro Flamingo from Las Vegas. How are you, sir? Hey, how you doing today, Sam? I'm doing all right. Excellent. Uh, i got a couple of things I want to talk about. One thing is the Manafort um, case. Yep. The first sentencing. This is just a perfect example of the color-coded justice system working the way it's intended to. And, um... You know, and uh, I really got to give you credit because you, you really made me think about when you vote, you know, elections have consequences and you have judges like this letting moral support to criminals and white collar thugs like Manafort, literally just letting them skate by. Yep. I mean, I mean it's, it's just disgusting. OK, at the, at the end of the day, it's just disgusting. You know, he's, he's letting moral support to Trump and Manafort. And, you know, it's just like you, you see this all over the country, like in, like in the Van Dyke case, you know, that cop who got um, prosecuted in Chicago for killing Laquan McDonald, his three other fellow officers who covered it, who covered it up, you know, I, I believe the judge's name was either Vincent Gone or Dominica Stevenson. She's basically lending them moral support too. You know, these are fine cops and X, Y, and Z. It's just, you know, we really need to clean up like the, these, uh, the, like, the judicial system, in my opinion. Well, there's, like, really I mean, change, though, there's, 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 there's two different, there's, there's, there's a couple of different things going on at the same time. One is, um, uh, on one level, I think that like, Broadly speaking, I think our criminal justice system is too punitive. OK, on another level, uh, despite that fact, we see we're able to see these type of disparities where, um, you know, cheating the American public out of millions and millions of dollars of tax revenue and probably uh, doing, uh, you know, assisting others by certainly by the the, the lobbying he worked, uh, you know, he did. That was semi illicit during that time as well um, is not considered to be a serious crime. Right. Um, uh, According to this judge. I mean, um, so I think, you know, I don't know if this guy should be spending 19 years in prison at age 76 for those uh, for for the for the um, for his cheating on on the taxes and his foreign lobbying. He should. But I well, I don't should. I don't know. I mean because I I don't I, but I certainly know that, you know, someone who uh, votes by mistake um, when she has a, a felony conviction shouldn't be getting more time. I mean, well, she shouldn't be getting any time. Well, yes, exactly. Yes. I mean, so so we have to- we 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 have um, she shouldn't be getting any time. She's getting five years. I mean, so you have one person who's trying to do their civic duty and mistakenly did it wrong, and another person who's specifically trying to screw over the civic, uh, the, the civic uh, commons. So, right. Um, I mean, I do, I, I do want to say. So I think you know, I say, I say, rather than call for uh, him to get more time, I'm more comfortable in saying like we have some problems with the disparities and uh, with just being overly um, uh, uh, punitive. True. I, on some level, I agree with you, but then, you know, Sam, you have to look through the lens of the color code of justice system because the judge is an art conservative. You know what I'm saying? You look, at, you look at this guy's wild comments. He's basically letting moral support to this guy. And, you know, it's a white color criminal, it's a white guy. He's letting them off. I mean, he's letting them off. Because if you're one hand, you're absolutely right. I completely agree with you. But on the other hand, when you add the layer of color to it, it's just, oh, come on. Yeah, this is a nice old white guy. Just let this guy off. You know what I mean? He's a blameless life. And there's one other thing I, I, I want to say before I, I jump. Um, the talk of reparations has, has come up a lot. Yeah. And um. And uh, and I feel, you know, nobody. Well, let me say this. I think Bernie. I think Bernie, AOC, and Liz Warren. You know, the, the other guys. It, it, it doesn't even matter. You know, what I'm saying they're irrelevant. But um, they really seem to dodge around the topic, especially. When, when it was all, when it was about the American descendants of slaves, and uh, I was like your opinion on that. And one more thing before I jump, by the way, also you should have uh, Ibram X. Kendi on. The guy he, he made he wrote an excellent book called. Uh, hold on, let me just right here, Sam. I'm sorry, I'm drawing a blank. It's called it's "Stamp from the Beginning." Uh, Stamp from, from the Beginning: The Definitive History of Racist Ideas in America. It's a really good book. You should have that author on. You uh, know, and, uh, it, it was. 
It's a really good. We had him on Dope Boys. We had him on two Dope Boys in a podcast, and I yeah, he should be on the list. Yeah. All right, appreciate the call. Well, let me. I'll I'll answer the question about the reparations. I mean, because from my perspective, um, I. I think the, 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 the term itself is obviously uh, a little bit loaded in the context of, uh, of American politics. And I can understand why uh, people in the Democratic primary want to avoid <coughs> using that term. I think that's why, uh, you know, Bernie doesn't want to use it. I don't know to what extent any of the other candidates want to use it. Um, I, I do think that there are specific proposals, though, that I think you could support um and talk about them i mean i guess you know i don't know it's a good question because i think on some level you could have proposals that would address the need for reparations um there's also uh perhaps maybe a um a a more sort of like I don't want to say psychological but sociological need to indicate that we are uh, that that um um, that reparations are due. Um, but certainly at the end of the day, I am more, you know, sort of, I think the idea of specific proposals that address things like wealth disparity, and let's face it, these are, there are reparations for uh, slavery, but there should also be reparations for things like redlining. I mean, and, and the, well, and also, yeah, and frankly, maybe the Native American genocide as well. But well, yes, I, yeah, but yes, but, I'm, but my point housing. being, my point being is that we're not just talking about <laughs> things that happened 250 years ago uh, or 150 years ago. We're talking about things that happened 50 years ago, 30 years ago. I mean, these are uh, uh, we have had a systemic disenfranchising of political power in this country, uh, particularly of black Americans uh, and obviously in Native Americans, but also a- an economic one and, um, and, and not and not just a function of discrimination as we experience it, it socially, but in terms of just plain old finances. Home ownership is the primary driver of wealth in this country. And time and time again, the ability of African-Americans to develop wealth through their homes has been limited, actively limited, not just by uh, by the private sector, but by 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 government, by by the government. I, I think I just can I just I agree with everything. I just want to throw a few other important things about this in really quickly. So one Everybody basically like Bernie uh, can and should improve his answer, but he's actually being relatively honest about this. People like Castro and Harris and Warren are just lying. They don't like reparations politically means I think it's H.R. 40, which Tulsi Gabbard is a co-sponsor of. And it's a specific piece of legislation in the House to establish a commission and a process by which that can happen. So there's one candidate that supports that. Everybody else is being totally disingenuous or outright dishonest. And I think the really big problem, too, is that like if you go back to Barack Obama in like 2015, he dismissed reparations like totally outright. Right. And then he pivoted to, well, but if you deal with these systems problems, they'll have a disproportionate effect on race, which is actually what Bernie said in 2016, which was insufficient then and insufficient now. But the incredible thing is that that's literally what Harris and Warren and Castro are doing is they say, they're giving the exact same answer that Obama gave, but then saying they support reparations. So my actual real irritation here, in addition to the disingenuousness of the politics towards Bernie, is I think you're undermining both arguments because you do not want to create a frame around programs like Medicare for All that they're a form of reparations because they are not. They are universal programs, period. And then on the other hand, you don't want to undermine a very specific case about historical injustice of African Americans as a universal program. So that's a, and and the last thing I'll add is I think David Brooks coming out and supporting reparations as a form of collective psychological acceptance is an indication of how dematerialized these conversations can get that we should be aware of. Yeah. I I mean, my, my comp, I feel conflicted about this myself. Um, I, I think my issue with it is that it doesn't go far enough necessarily because on the one hand 
uh, slavery was an economic arrangement and leads to economic led to economic disparities that still persist as as well as, you know, colonialism and all kinds of other practices. Um, so it would make sense to have an economic solution to that. But there it, it, it's so hard to confront the harm done by systems like slavery without confronting capitalism as well right because slavery was a form of primitive accumulation at some point in time in the development of capitalism some people came along and took some shit that wasn't theirs in this case human beings also the land mass that became the united states also you know back in europe the enclosure of common lands so if you're going to start trying to undo all of the harm that those things have done up to and including you know uh, oh, you don't have land anymore. All you have to sell is your labor power. You're going to be exploited or, or hyper exploited um, in, in ways that intersect with racial identity. Uh, you, you just you got to keep going. I don't know. I feel I feel conflicted about this for many different reasons. I'll leave it at that for now. OK. Calling from an 860 area code. Who's this? Where are you calling from? Hey, guys, this is Anthony from Connecticut. Anthony from Connecticut. What's on your mind, Anthony? Uh, I was just calling because um, I think last week it was uh, when Michael was hosting the show. He was speaking with a woman about uh, the power of getting involved. And uh, I don't use social media. So I was hoping you guys could help direct me and uh, the rest of us in uh, ways to get involved. Um, Check out a local. Well, do you do? I mean, do you, do you have internet? Do you have the internet? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. well, I mean, uh, you know, you could you could look for a, your local DSA, or you could look look for your local indivisible uh, group, or you could find a candidate you like and go ask to volunteer. You could um, sign up uh, for alerts from Move On. Uh, there's there's a myriad of of different uh, ways that you could and I would just I would, uh, you know, try all of them. See, uh, you know, which organization seems to fit your, um, you know, uh, your perspective and w what kind of stuff they're doing that you, you'd like to do. I mean, you can uh, join the local Democratic Party, run for, you know, some type of uh, office. I mean, you know, not necessarily, you know, an elected one to become an official in the Democratic Party. You'll have you, you'll find that you'll have probably outsized um, uh, power that uh, you're shocked that you're going to have. I mean, that's that been the experience of like a lot of the people who have gotten involved in that stuff as of late. So I would try all of that. Uh, or, you know, uh, I mean, in terms of politics, go oh, Look up. I'm not sure where in in Connecticut you live, but um, there are uh, community organizations that are always, uh, you know, looking for help and uh, agitate in terms of politics. So, uh, try any of that. Appreciate the call. Uh, let's go to the IMs for a moment. Water boat from Kashmir. Morning, Joe. Asks, are you a capitalist? Hickenlooper responds, I would attend a gay wedding, so I'm not a homophobe. <laughs> uh, West Coast comrade. Hey Sam, did you uh, pay up after? Um, Losing your uh, Will Bernie run bet? I got your back, Michael. How much did I bet you? Five bucks? Uh, yeah, you did. But there wasn't there. I thought there was some. It might be a little bit more because it was also with Perrine. But at least five bucks. I don't even remember that night. Uh, public private. You were Paul. very lubricated. Uh, Sam, I'm begging uh, to wonder if Jimmy Reefer Cake is collaborating with the FDA because his stuff is so damn cheesy. What do you think? Hmm. Retcon. Ooh, whoa, uh, whoa. Critical support for I Jimmy was, Reefer. I was going to say uh, glass <laughs> houses, good. buddy. Retcon. I wanted to share with your viewers, listeners, that I uh, that stop and shop employees are about to strike. Wanted to send solidarity in a call. Maybe get your thoughts or, or heard to their corporate offices. They want to take away their health care or make it incredibly expensive. No more time and a half, et cetera. Terrible company. Work for 22 hours a week or less for most employees. They have made billions for their shareholders this year. I don't work there anymore, but my comrades do. Punch a scab. Shop and stop. Fo stop and shop. Folks, do not cross the picket line when people uh, are um, are picketing uh, when, when, when uh, labor strikes, particularly at a supermarket. I know it's a pain in the butt, but um, talk about just like sort of paying it forward. That's your small investment right now. 
contemplate like if you shop at stop and shop where you would go just to make it convenient for yourself um Colin from Nebraska. Hey, I'm our crew. My roommate supported Bernie in the 2016 election, but does not now because he says Bernie owning more than one home is hypocritical to his message. Any comments? Yeah. FYI, he listens to Rogan and Shapiro. Oh, oh so he's he's just becoming an well, idiot. I mean, the um, I don't think the um, the the problem that uh, Bernie has with our government is that um, people who who are successful can't own more than one home. I think that the issue is is that um, they should do so after they have contributed uh, enough money to society to make sure that everyone has access to some fundamental quality uh, uh, things that that fundamentally determine quality of life. So um, that being things like Healthcare, that being things like access to uh, early education and to uh, uh, higher education, uh, not just access, but literally like free access, <laughs> genuine access, that money is not an obstacle to uh, attending these things um, and to getting these things, um, that we do not need such massive concentrations of wealth. I don't know how much his, his house uh, are, are valued at, and um, I, I don't think that's terribly relevant any more so than someone who wants to end climate change and flies an airplane. Yeah, I, I would ask your friend. I mean, I, I think it's just such an irrelevant conversation, but if, you know, is it if it's all just a question of, like, hypocrisy or not, is he saying that if somebody promotes corruption and inequality that— then that's great and perfectly in keeping with their own personal corruption and like bad personal, you know, practices or, you know, is it, is cause I've, I've had a little bit of luck with that in a few conversations. It's like, right. Wait, if you're worried you're about hypocrisy, like, then you want, uh, yeah, it's like Donald well, so Trump to come out and just promote. Yeah. Uh, I guess they should just all be talking about getting bribed by oil companies and, and, and it's ridiculous. And also as much as I just won't give an inch on this and I just think like, you know, if if Bernie actually did wear like five thousand dollar Briani suits, awesome. That would be great. Like gangster Bernie. I don't care. It's all about the policy. This is not the guy to really like a couple houses in Vermont with like a big family. This is not uh, this is not like a home in Sardinia and an apartment on the Upper West. Like it's ridiculous. Um. Contagious Chameleon. Have you guys seen Max Blumenthal's coverage on Venezuela? The U.S. government is really exaggerating the state of the country for their own imperial interests, which leads me to a question. Do you think Bernie's foreign policy is viewed more dangerous by the establishment than his domestic policy? Um, I don't know if the, his foreign policy is viewed more dangerous by the establishment. Maybe, uh, maybe, maybe in some respects, probably not. Because I think money is, you know, the, the money and interest are much sort of clearer. And I think there's always a feeling that, like, the foreign policy apparatus is much more sclerotic and sort of edified, I think, in some respects. And I don't think they have the same measure of fear that sort of people do about domestic politics because that's much more malleable. But, but on the other hand, this is the next area of cliche debunking, like... People were so freaked out when Bernie Sanders was talking about Medicare for all a couple years ago. And that's just been kind of like through his leadership and kind of put into the mainstream. And we're in the middle of can we have an actual debate about Israel? We're in the middle of can we oppose a coup in Venezuela? And so I think there's actually a huge amount of fear and resistance. Speaking of uh, Venezuela, earlier we played a uh, clip of John Hicken Hickenlooper. Um, for whatever reason, unable to say uh, that to answer the question that he was a capitalist. Um, I mean, I think he self-evidently is. I mean, I uh, I I, I um, don't have much of a problem saying that I am a capitalist. Uh, I mean, I sit here and run a business and still have a fairly robust uh, critique of capital capitalism. I would say probably 
more so than John Hickenlooper. I mean, uh, Engels and William Morris were also technically capitalists. He, I would imagine, yeah, right? one sense of the word. Somebody's Sorry if I was being pedantic earlier. I just think it's important to make the distinction between, um, yes, I uphold the system of capitalism, and yes, I have the class position of capitalist within capitalism. I live like a capitalist every day, John. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, that uh, being the case. Um, so uh, Howard Schultz, having seen uh, John Hickenlooper, um, I guess, basically uh, come out of some type of strategy session where he's like, why can't I get any attention from anybody except for J Scarborough? And his advisor's going, John, just listen. It probably won't come up. Just don't say that you're a huge capitalist. I mean, ironically, that'll probably be his most popular uh, media clip of his entire campaign. It, it, w it certainly will be. And and I'm sure the guys who are basically on his payroll are going, that's the way we want you to play it, John. We set you up for that perfectly. That's We got you super viral clip. And Nailed it. So uh, Hickenlooper is afraid to say that he's a capitalist for whatever reason, because I, I, I honestly don't know what he what lane he thinks he's running in in the uh, Democratic Party. But uh, Howard Schultz weighs in, I guess, the uh, self-proclaimed not the brightest guy in the room. Howard Schultz <laughs> weighs in by saying even if even a successful businessman and entrepreneur like Govern Governor Hickenlooper can't openly support capitalism in the Democratic primary, it's clear this is Senator Sanders' party now. And I would say, from your mouth to, uh, to wh whoever is in here. charge of, of the Democratic Party's ears, but let's listen to uh, Howard Schultz pretend like he knows what's going on in Venezuela because that's the talking point du jour. Can you define socialism? Can I define socialism? Yeah. Well, interestingly enough... No, I cannot. It's interesting that you would laugh at that. I think they might be laughing because the person who asked the question is listed as a German. Oh, it was in, Ger it was in German? Just a German. Oh. Pause it. Incidentally, you know, as someone who is a performer and has been in situations where you have to think on your feet and whatnot, what you're witnessing is someone who doesn't know how to answer this question. And he can't, I mean, this is what's fascinating to me. Like, you're going out. You've been on 60 Minutes. You've been on the Today Show. You've been on, you know, like, every single possible. There is probably no one in the country who has bought his way onto more media over the past month and a half, let's say, whose whole agenda is to say the Democratic Party has gone socialist so they can't possibly represent, you know, the members of the Democratic Party. And you, you haven't even, never mind the right one or the wrong one, you haven't even come up with your line about what is socialism. Like, how do you, like, this is a guy that we're supposed to entrust with the, with the country and he doesn't even have the forethought to go out there and say, like, oh, I'm critiquing the... The whole basis of the critique of the Democratic Party is they've gone socialist. I haven't figured out how to define it yet. I haven't even thought about it long enough to literally, like, you can come up with a, any definition of socialism you want and present it. You could be wrong, but at least you'd have an answer. And this guy's stalling. Go back. It's just unbelievable. This is exactly what, like, this is, this is what happens, like, if you ask your, like, a teenager, like, what, what, what's going on in this room? Uh, oh, hey, I forgot to tell you, uh, I need that money for, uh, uh, for the uh, field trip. No, no, no. I asked you what's going on in this room. Uh, oh, did I tell you, uh, did you see that car accident on, uh, on Flatfoot? You know, this is what's... All right, so go ahead. Because the person who asked the question is listed as a German. Oh, it was in, Ger it was in German? Just a German. Oh. <laughs> well, if you, if you want a good description for socialism... I think, just look at Venezuela. Um, <laughs> Pause it. Incidentally, aside from that not being a good description, but that was not the, co the, the question wasn't what's a good description of socialism. It's what is the definition of socialism? What is it? Like this is the worst example 
of some like 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 literally junior high kid who do- hasn't done his homework. Socialism, and, you ask? Yo, oh, that's a good a question, and I will tell you why. Answer for many. Well, this is this is why Thatcher has the whole. That's when you run out of other people's money, right? Like you develop something like that. Yeah, at least yeah. come up with some type of like dumb catchphrase instead of like I'm going to fish around in the. Oh, I remember hearing Venezuela on the car radio. See, what I did Charlie it. Kirk say? Yeah, exactly. Maybe right. he should hire some uh, highly paid consultants to help him with his campaign. Yeah, no kidding. I think, just look at Venezuela. Um, it's a, uh, you don't like that? Yeah, because well, I'm buying time, uh, buying time. We do not, we, we don't want a government takeover of our lives. We want the freedom of, of being able to pursue happiness in America. The pursuit of happiness. We want our independence. We want our free enterprise to be sustainable. Capitalism has created more jobs, has moved more people out of poverty, and created the greatest system in the world, which is America. What? Is it None of this positive. No. None of this makes any sense. America is not a system. It's a country. Capitalism is the system. This is just, it is stunning. You know what it really does show you? Uh, Honestly, you can make a lot of money. In fact, it may even help you to be a C student. Howard Schultz is the biggest C student. I mean, and you talk slowly. It's like you pretend like you're thinking about things. He reads the digest versions of like Malcolm Gladwell books. It's un, yeah, right. That's his reading. If anything, he shows the flaws in a system that will let you become so wildly successful while being so intellectually incurious. That I, being said, most C students I've met are a lot cooler. Yeah, I don't mind. I don't mind. Um, you know, not very bright people <laughs> making money. I don't. That in and of itself is not. I don't mind success by not very bright people. That's fine. It's just that this guy's not capable. I wouldn't trust him to, honestly to lead me out of like a like a brothers and yeah, sisters will restore the queen. We'll get rid of the pursuit of happiness. <laughs> it's a goddamn bourgeoisie what else, what fiction. What other, what other, and we'll gibberish. eliminate it. Just is it gibberish. perfect? No. Does it need to be refined? Yes. Do businesses have a moral obligation in addition to making money? Yes. But stop. Absolutely fundamentally wrong. There is nothing, nothing that obligates a business to do anything on any moral standards. Nowhere, nowhere is the existence of any business. Is it written into their charter? I mean, they, they can claim that it is, but they have no obligation. Obligation is something that is imposed upon you from outside of you. There is no obligation on any business to do that. You can get a special thing that says, I'm a C Corp or whatever it is. Like, I'm a, you know, a, a, a G Corp. I do good things. But that's just a voluntary. That's just the way that you want to organize it. Most corporations, including Starbucks, have one, one obligation. And that is to their shareholders, which is exactly why you need extensive government uh, uh, regulation as to what they can do because otherwise they will only fulfill their primary object uh, their uh, their primary objective any business today that is in business just to make money is going to be shallow it's not enduring you're not going to attract and retain great people (laughs) but those businesses that achieve the fragile balance between profit and humanity and understand (laughs) <laughs> that the gifts of business is to lift people up and create opportunity for everyone. That is a system that I embrace. That is a system that I'm for. And anything that has to do with things that suggest that everything is going to be free and we're going to live in a world that is, cons- that is inconsistent with the heritage of the country is wrong. Mm. It's not going to be free. And it's, You're it's, pay- it's an extreme position and it's just not who we are. It's not who we have. That is the longest non-answer in the, like, I think I've ever witnessed, you know, from a guy who is, should have no problems just saying socialism is this and that's why it's bad. 
Well, it's interesting because even he admits that prophets and humanity exist in some kind of opposition to one another. Right. Right. Because it does. I mean, that is that is also like grade school obviousness. I mean, there's a, there's there's nothing in the charter when you get uh, when you sign up to become a corporation. There's nothing in there that says, incidentally, you have a moral obligation to do well by your community. If you did, half half the things we talk about in this program would be completely irrelevant. Um, I, I'm just. You know what's great? That he, level he of stupidity it. is yes, exactly. He well, he's I don't like, know. He's like, it was a little bit of a rocky start, and for some reason, these idiots didn't get Venezuela. But when I really started talking about who our country was, another thing he did there is, and I'll keep noting this, is that Mister, like, we can't be polarized. We all need to come together. And of course, there's no moral difference between supporting Medicare for all and kidnapping children is still basic everything he said is predicated on delegitimizing like the citizenship and uh, patriotism status of anybody to even like the marginal left of him no. this isn't our country this isn't who we are <laughs> and like i don't necessarily think that he's stupid right i don't want to be making like some kind of ableist iq based argument i think he's lazy <laughs> and that's different Yes. I don't want to make an IQ based both. argument, but I, I want to make a stupid based argument. He's definitely he, he's so self satisfied and so lazy to not even come up with that answer, right? Like he might have an even, IQ, he might have a good IQ, but he's stupid. Is how I'll put it. Um, let's go. I, 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 uh, let's skip Varney for a second. I want to go. Th this is um, this is sort of uh, a little bit a little bit poor timing. When did uh, Debbie Wasserman Schultz and Donna Shalala put this out? Now, look, I want to just I, I feel like, you know, uh, we need one of these um, uh, disclaimers before we ever talk about Venezuela. I am not um, I, I, I have watched the videos purporting to show that there's no uh, problems whatsoever in Venezuela. I have uh, dug into the claims of, of how many, uh, you know, hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people who have left because of, of things there. I've read on both sides of, of this issue. I don't claim to know the reality, the lived reality of 25 percent of Venezuelans or 51 percent of Venezuelans or 75 percent of Venezuelans or Venezuelans who live above a certain uh, income level or below a certain income level. None of that is relevant in terms of the question as to whether we should be intervening, certainly not militarily, but in any fashion beyond the most, um, I think, um, you know, d soft diplomacy. So when we're uh, doing things like uh, I embargoes and shutting off uh, 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 ability to get funds, we're just punishing the Venezuelan people uh, to the extent that there's any efficacy. It is doing stuff like that is predicated on the suffering of the people there so that they d d depose their, their, their leadership. Um, now, with that said, we do know the reality of the story that we were told from U.S. officials, uh, from the vice president on down, about uh, the humanitarian aid that was brought to uh, Venezuela on a bridge. But before we get to that reality, let's go to this reality with Debbie Wasserman Schultz and Donna Shalala, who uh, find themselves, I guess, on one end of that bridge. Is this the same bridge? Uh, trying to make an argument. Well, let's listen. The humanitarian aid is just a little ways away. Maduro could let it in and save his people, but of course he will not. The container that he put on this bridge to block it says peace. There is no peace here. There are only on the other side of this bridge, hungry people, starving children, children who are dying, we have medicines. The community, the Latin American community, Colombia, 50 different countries have contributed to make sure we can save the Venezuelan people. Maduro must go. We came here today to support the people of Venezuela and to thank the people of Colombia. And together we say, Viva Venezuela. Viva Venezuela. 
Oh yeah, well, I mean, I'm, I'm glad folks are so concerned about Venezuela in, in the U.S. Congress. It's nice. I remember them uh, being longtime uh, concerned about uh, Venezuela. Um, here is uh, how that aid got destroyed. Now we know it was not a function of uh, Maduro's people um, uh, putting the aid, uh, you know, uh, burning the, the aid. It was, it turns out, according to a New York Times um uh, sourced video, uh, a protester who was protesting alongside the aid trucks, throwing Molotov cocktails at the, um, at the, uh, the Maduro, uh, police forces and accidentally lighting one of the trucks on fire here. Uh, show it again. You can see there's the Molotov cocktail throwing it. And the second one, the rag leaves the Molotov cocktail lands on the uh, uh on the truck i mean i'm just shocked to hear that there was molotov cocktails my understanding is that like you know molotov cocktails like i remember when those palestinians had the kites that they would let up that the that were on fire yeah, I mean, if and how fights, horrific that was right. uh and called for snipers to be shooting at the kite kite flyers uh i also just love that they specifically mention the role of columbia which like I, of course they play a role but like the colombian government uh, very much would give the venezuelan government a run for its money and exceed it in many ways in terms of what they do in areas where there's an insurgency and this government came into power canceling a peace deal with the farc under the umbrella of a former president alvaro uribe where there's at least some WikiLeaks cables indicated that he had like relationships with Pablo Escobar going back to the 80s. So that's who like this Can't democratic Ku Klux is. Well, he right. is a small businessman uh, who, who built a, an enterprise committed to the types of values that Howard Schultz is trying to put across. I, I mean, it's just the um, uh, the hypocrisy is astounding. But, you know, if people want to go down there and uh, say that you should let in humanitarian aid, that's all well and good. But the United States has a um, horrible record of intervening. Like there's, it's, it is very difficult to come up with an example of when this worked out well. Well, they're politicized. I mean, they're, they're this, I, I mentioned this last week, but I want to keep hitting uh, the CIA program in Pakistan with fake vaccines where they used to collect DNA right. for the bin Laden operation. This and, and somebody pointed out to me, not only was that an important point to make, but that I talked about consequences, you know, theoretical consequences. There were real ones. Doctors were killed. Oh, yeah. No, we heard about this. And people one. stopped taking vaccinations. And people stopped oh, yeah, taking as broad to for, Nigeria. Yeah. So what you're doing with this is you're you're not you're you're. You're actually handing, uh, if, if you oppose the Maduro government, you're handing them a correct political talking point and you're undermining every single organization that might legitimately be trying to get, you know, ease the situation. There. Right. Well, and here's the secret is that it did work out well for some people, right? It worked of out course. well for the oil companies and the ruling class of those countries and the U.S. government in its attempts to impose a certain economic program on the world. Well, I would say a narrow, a narrow slice of the U.S. government in many respects. But, um, but yes, of course, there, there was definitely, there were even winners in Iraq. It's just not the Iraqi people. Well, one of the, I think Ken Silverstein pointed out in his report that from there, which is interesting, that it doesn't seem one of the kind of funny dynamics of this for like the coup mongers the United States and then also the Maduro government is like the oil flow and that relationship is is working so uh the oil companies aren't necessarily that excited one way or another about this because they're getting their revenue and that trade is happening regardless either way yeah um sure they don't you know it's not like they care or oppose it but they're not like gunning for it because it doesn't really implicate their revenue right now this is uh, pretty awesome. Uh, let's let's play this clip of uh, of oh well let's let's talk about Tucker Carlson, all right? Because I've got to I've got to uh, leave in about five or ten minutes. Um, so listen, I have been the subject of somebody digging through my tweets, finding a tweet that um, was that. Uh, 
use satire as uh, making a point that Roman Polanski, I'll get very specific about it because it was a very specific tweet, that Roman Polanski um, should not be um, forgiven for skipping the country after being convicted of statutory rape, skipping his sentencing hearing, because he was a good filmmaker. There were people at the time who were circulating a petition. This is about 10 years ago now. And I was responding to it. Now, to be fair, I was satirical in the way that I responded to that. So I made a satirical comment, which was, I don't care about Polanski, but if my, or Polanski, yeah, I'd, but if my daughter is ever raped, I hope it's by a much older man who has a great sense of mise-en-scene. Now, most people, I would say, I want to say who are English speakers, but I would think even people who uh, speak English as a second or third language and have any sense of, of the way that uh, language is spoken and have met uh, normal people, even if they had never met me or heard me, would know that that's, a, that's very hard to believe that someone meant that literally, that they want someone who has a, uh, an ability to uh, create a good um, uh, scene in, uh, in the context of directing a movie, would want that would be a requisite to want their child raped. That would be a weird thing for people to assume. And certainly if people knew me, uh, they would know that that was a, a satirical remark. And it's not like I don't have um, literally thousands of hours of, of, of on air uh, talking that, that would reinforce that point. Who's laughing now, Sam? Which is why ultimately, even though uh, Cernovich got me fired initially, ultimately I was hired back. Now, Tucker Carlson has a little bit of problem with uh, audio that has surfaced of his. Uh, and that is because it's not inconsistent. It's not, it's not, let's see, listen, it is not a shock to the system to imagine that Tucker Carlson is um, a misogynist, that Tucker Carlson is dismissive of the ability to be raped if you're in a marriage. That's the thing I find most disturbing. There's a bunch of stuff that's come out where he said, you know, uh, nasty thing and, and derogatory things about uh, women that, you know, shock jock stuff. And, you know, but, but we're not talking about well, you know, back in the 50s, 1950s, people had a very weird notion of like if you were married, that you were sort of the chattel of your husband. This is in 2006, 2009, where Tucker Carlson is talking about a guy who was a uh, cult leader who would arrange marriages between people in their late 20s and... Uh, women below the age of 17. And Tucker Carlson is saying that guy shouldn't have gone to jail. The, the guy who actually married her should go to jail. But then he says something about sort of excusing a rapist that I find really problematic. This is the most problematic of all the stuff that he says. Here, here let's, pl let's play this. Well, actually, he's not in prison for that. He didn't warn Jeff didn't marry underage girls. No, he, he's, in, he's in prison for facilitation of child rape. Whatever the hell that means. That means he's that... In prison. He's in prison because that, he's weird and unpopular, and he has a different <laughs> lifestyle that other people find creepy. No, he's an accessory to the rape of children. That is a felony and a serious one at that. A f what do you mean an accessory? He's, like, got some weird religious cult where he thinks it's okay to, you know, marry underage girls. But he didn't do it. Why wouldn't the guy who actually did it, who had sex with an underage girl, he should be the one who's doing what? life. The, ra the, the rapist in this case has made a lifelong commitment to live and take care of the person. So I... it is a little different. I mean, let's just be honest That's... about it. That's the part that I find the most disturbing of all the things, and I'm not going to harp on the other stuff, uh, but the idea, the rapist in this case has made a lifelong commitment to live and take care of the person, so it's a little different. The idea that rape cannot exist in the context of a marriage um, in 2009 is, um, is sick. Never mind the fact that you're talking about a 16-year-old girl 
who um, may not, you know, we don't let them vote. Uh, some states you have to be 16 and a half to drive. Um, you can't um, you can't work. I think a certain amount of hours. I mean, there's a whole host of things that we don't let 16 year olds do because we agree that they don't necessarily have, broadly speaking, as a default, enough life experience to make um, reasoned decisions on this. We don't allow them to drink alcohol. In states that pot is legal, we don't allow them to smoke pot. The idea that we would um, uh, allow them to uh, say, you know, it's okay to a rapist as long as you're going to take care of me or whatever it is. I mean, this is just sort of sick stuff. Yeah, there's an extremely high bar for them to be even emancipated from their parents. And what's even worse is that Tucker is sort of poo-pooing this stuff instead of just coming out and saying, I was wrong. Uh, he's actually sort of, I think, some way defending his comments as being uh, a long time ago. Is that Where, where is he? Uh, here he is. He's, he's tweeting out. Um, oh, these here just received the uh, following comment. OK, so here it is. Uh, all must be attributed to Tucker Carlson. There's a statement that he made uh, to a report of Media Matters <laughs> caught me saying something naughty. Some things, some things. He should some, have said something, something naughty on a radio show more than a decade ago. Rather than express the usual ritual contrition, how about this? I'm on television every weeknight for a live for an hour. If you want to know what I think, you can watch. Anyone who disagrees with my views is welcome to come on and explain why. I'll be happy to go on uh, Tucker Carlson's yeah. show and discuss him why I think it's uh, disgusting, the idea that um, he is uh, excusing um, what we have decided is rape in this country uh, based upon the rapist's willingness to take care of that person for the rest of their life or a promise at the very least that I'll take care of you. Um, but what's really funny is that Tucker Carlson, the idea that uh, uh, something that happened more than a decade ago, and I think 2009 was not really more than a decade ago, but maybe a month or two. Um, he also seems to think that it's problematic in terms of Joe Biden. With Joe Biden's comments from decades ago, here it is, it's... Uh, <laughs> Um, a Biden's past comes back to haunt him He's and foiling himself with his own logic here. Now, I oh, personally, man. I personally have an issue with what Biden uh, has, has said in the past in terms of policies, in terms of uh, some of his rhetoric and particularly in terms of women, but also in terms of banking and in terms of antitrust, civil and rights, civil rights and whatnot. But um, <laughs> I'm at least my defense for that uh, tweet was not that it was nine or 10 years ago. My defense was, it's a piece of satire. It's quite obvious that I am against people apologizing for rape. And he's not even bothering to make that comment because he can't. I'm perfectly happy to go on Tucker Carlson's show and explain to him that Pizzagate was apparently a giant act of projection. Right. And I will also say this, that um, I don't know if Fox should fire him because I think it's perfectly consistent with Fox News to have that type of attitude towards women, they it was basically their business practices, as far as I can tell, and there's no reason to believe um, that they've made any change in their perspective uh, towards women. And so, you know, Fox News can uh, take care of their own. It's weird. There's a couple times in these clips, two different times, where he mentions, like, this rape isn't like a woman being pulled off, a housewife being pulled from the street. Like, there's one where he's talking about sex workers, how it's like, it's different if you rape a sex worker. Because he says, uh, it's a little more complicated than if some, you know, housewife claims she was pulled off the street and raped. And then he also said this about the Jeffs thing. Is like... Um, the what thing? About the Warren Jeffs, this uh, oh, oh, this right. uh, guy who was with the uh, child, the children marriages. He's like... Um, I'm just telling you that arranging a marriage between a 16-year-old and a 27-year-old is not the same as pulling a stranger off the street and raping her. Right. This is, this is the attitude that has permeated the right, the notion of actual rape, the idea that there are relationships that a man and a woman can have where the man is incapable of committing rape because of their relationship. The woman has tacitly given 
uh, preemptive an okay to have sex with me whenever you want under any conditions because I've agreed to X, Y, or Z because I've agreed that you can pay me for sex or because I've agreed to uh, be your wife there. The man has total license. That person becomes their chattel. And by the way, like this problem is not exclusive to creepy sex cults. Like there are plenty of states that will make an exception to the minimum age of marriage or even consent uh, if the girl in question is pregnant and the parents sign off on it. So, it, you know, depending what kind of parents you get, either this is prosecuted as a crime or you are just legally signed over to your abuser. All right. I got to take a uh, quick break. Uh, Michael's going to step in for the rest of the show. Um Let's put a little music on, musical or, or interlude, but don't put it on the, uh, okay. The Michael music. This is Danarchy, uh, safe. Welcome back to the Majority Report. I was warming up in the bullpen, loosening my arm, uh, and then I just got a little bit nauseous. Last segment. Um, so <laughs> this is an awkward transition, but it is what it is. Donald Trump's CPAC speech uh, from last week was a reminder that he still can be funny and he is, I, you know, I don't know. People always say he's losing it. I don't, I mean, did he ever have it? He never had it. Yeah. Um, one of my favorite moments in this speech was a pretty dead on impersonation of Jeff Set. It was, it was sort of 50% good impersonation, impersonation and 50% like what every schmuck from like New York or Massachusetts thinks all Southerners sound like, which right. is funny in its own way. So, but it's especially funny given some history we'll get yeah, into. Yeah, we're going to get it right. So this is not just funny in and of itself. There's a there's a little bit of uh, a little bit of history to this. I'm telling on myself with this impression. Yeah, I might I might be telling on myself. All right, check it out. The attorney general says I'm going to recuse myself, <laughs> <laughs> and I said, Why the hell didn't he tell me that before I put him in? Can you just give that to me one more time, please? I was crying in the office this morning. The attorney general says, I'm going to recuse myself. <laughs> and I said, why the hell didn't he tell me that before I put him in? How do you recuse yourself? I love how with Trump, this is how, this is how people, this is how toxic personalities set the stage for themselves, right? Because we're going to get into how he told on himself in a second. But like, it's just skirted over at this point because we've already heard Trump say like so many things like this that it's like his actual complaint there is he should have told me that he wasn't going to cover criminal investigations <laughs> against me. And he didn't promise complete immunity. <laughs> <laughs> that he would have my back in cover-ups, I would have never given him that job. I thought it was understood, Jeff. Yeah, this is definitely a moment for an Obama like if Eric Holder didn't say that he was going to cover my back in every goddamn thing. Incidentally, that's exactly how Michael Cohen describes how the Trump org operates. Like you don't, ex he doesn't right. explicitly ask for things. He just like hires you with the expectation that you know what his expectations are. It's the expectation. So if you recall, Jeff. Uh, 
um, Bob Woodward put out a book. I don't remember the name of it. Several months ago, whatever it don't wasn't, buy as, it. wasn't yeah. Don't buy it. And if you're and still uh, Michael Wolf, yeah, if you're, if Michael you're looking Wolf for one. like the trashy, dishy Trump gossip book, Michael Wolf, uh, that book is great. Um, but apparently, part of this uh, Woodward book was a lot of reporting that Trump called like Jeff Sessions an idiot or something like that, and mocked his intelligence and blah blah blah, all stuff that sounded like not only believable, but just like sort of like sky is blue type of statements. And Trump tweeted this out uh, September 4th, 2018. They're already credited. They're already discredited Woodward books. So many lies and phony sources has me calling Jeff Sessions, quote unquote, mentally retarded and quote unquote, a dumb Southerner. I said, neither never use those terms on anyone, including Jeff being a Southerner is. And if you're listening to this great, all in caps, it's a great thing. He made this up to divide. <laughs> Maybe we should play that impression one more time. Or did or did he read the Woodward lies about him and think to himself, you know what? Maybe I should do a Jeff Sessions impression. I now. didn't say that, but it is a good bit. I didn't say that now, but that is a good premise. The attorney general says, I'm going to recuse myself. <laughs> and I said... Why the hell didn't he tell me that before I put him in? <laughs> Why the hell did he tell him that before I put him in? <laughs> you imagine if Barack Obama in one week, David Axelrod went to jail for tax evasion. Uh, his lead counsel is testifying to Congress about perjuring himself on his behalf before going to jail. And then he had photos taken with a woman who probably runs a human trafficking ring. That's how that that of course the primary narrative there is the racial difference and the Tanahisi Coates essay on the first white president with Donald Trump is worth reading, but there's also just like how totally toxic personalities reset the boundaries for themselves. Like that's the it's like what? Of course I did that. Of so I like Cindy Yang. Yeah, of course I like Cindy Yang. What's oh because she's an Asian businesswoman we can't do work with her. Totally unfair. Um. And Donald Trump, amongst white evangelicals, uh, not evangelicals of other backgrounds, but white evangelicals he maintains high popularity with. And uh, he's re- rewarding the popularity of the Christian co- in, of the evangelical community with exactly the type of class and respect that you'd expect from Donald Trump. <laughs> I am not a Christian. And I'm not a particularly, or maybe not even at all a religious person, but this struck me as a little bit disrespectful. And this is according to reporter Rachel Scott. These are photos of signed Bibles today. President Trump signed Bibles while visiting visiting Beauregard, Alabama. That's a nice little call back there. Jeff Beauregard Sessions. Most importantly... I brought my Bible (laughs) (laughs) to sign it a community devastated by two deadly hurricanes, uh, tornadoes rather, excuse me. So there you have it. We're going to need more Sharpies down here. We're going to need a lot more Sharpies. Has anybody got an extra King James and a Sharpie? Yeah. (laughs) Can someone find me two Corinthians? I always get such (laughs) contentment from that passage. (laughs) You know, it serves the evangelicals right for getting behind him in the first place. Like they deserve every ounce of degradation he dishes out. I wish I had, oh, I can't find the Ben Shapiro quip ad because these guys are really doing a lot for religious expression and commer- and commerce. They're, yeah, they're, they're right. Stuart Vardy continues to be immensely upset. Elizabeth Warren, I don't know specifically uh, what policy they're dealing with here. I know that Elizabeth Warren has, of course, put put forward a really important anti-monopoly plan, but I think uh, with regards to Amazon, Google, Facebook, but this is uh, just a kind of broader, obvious comment about how taxpayers and broad public investment have allowed wealth to be created. You know, in this flow of arguments, there's the classical uh, trickle-down fantasy that wealth is created by a handful of magical rich people, like some type of Ayn Rand or 
the lords book. of creation. Right. And they just sort of ideate great ideas and then it just happens and everybody all of a sudden magically gets phones and TV dinners, whatever the hell else. If they, you have an iPhone, you can't be oppressed. You can't be oppressed. Whew. Let's fly him to Venezuela. Uh, then there's the, you know, obviously socialist argument of we need a broader democratization of the economy. And that, in fact, not only is it not a anti-enlightenment project, it's a fulfillment of the enlightenment because you're saying that human uh, ability to reason and collaborate doesn't stop when you enter into the economic arena. And then in the middle ground, there's all these different versions of basically, I would just say, a Keynesian argument. I think MMT is somewhere in there as well, uh, which is the reality is, is that there's a dynamic interdependent system so that even if you have somebody who has a business or a service or creative ideas, that might be true. There is in ingenuity. There are ideas. There are innovations. All those things are real in a marketplace. Uh, and none of them would exist in any way, shape, or form without broad-based social infrastructure. So both as a combination of basic ethics and providing basic decent life for people, as well as in a broader case about investment, uh, you have a collaborative economy between the public, private, and uh, civic sectors. And while maybe policy-wise, Bernie's you know to the left of Warren and there's real differences, but there is an actual ideological gulf there because I do think he has a bit more of a real class-based analysis of politics. And I think that she is the perfect messenger of this sort of more progressive argument. That uh, setup is relevant for understanding Stuart Varney's breakdown in response to her eminently sensible comments. We have to pay to help create some opportunities because after all, those great fortunes in America that people built worked hard, had great ideas, or inherited. Those great fortunes were built here in America with workers that all of us paid to educate, with uh, their goods got to market on roads and bridges that all of us helped to build. So what we're really saying is, look, just put a little bit back in the kitty. This is what we're asking for, pay a fair share, so the next kid has a chance to build something great, and the kid after that, and the kid after that. Wait, wait, Stuart, wait a minute. How much does that <laughs> sound like socialism to you? Oh, that is pure socialism. That's what it is. That is. Put a little bit back in the kid. They're already paying Are you taxes. kidding me? You live in New York City, and you make a good deal of money. Your tax rate is approaching 60%. In other words, the government of New York City, New York State, and the feds collectively together, they're going to take 60 cents on every dollar you make. And it's very similar in California, New Jersey, and other yeah, high-tax states. If, if... <laughs> so, of course, he's distorting the tax story there as well, specifically with regards to federal, because the rates go up not for every dollar you make, but after certain dollars you make so even under aoc's 70 percent plan the first what is it when does she kick in in a million a year i don't know actually when she kicks in the 70 percent rate but the point is you could make anywhere from a half a million a year to maybe even a million a year and until you get to that post number where you're already incredibly affluent then the 70 percent rate kicks in i mean look obviously this is all propaganda and it's funny to watch him have a tantrum but like it is actually, in fact, not socialism. They're having a tantrum and a conniption about the whole way that the modern United States and modern Europe were built, <laughs> which is a combination of public investment and private activity. That's the way every society on earth works. And even Stuart Varney, is not calling for some type of libertarian utopia. So he's just tantruming and being an idiot. But well, I love watching the cortisol shoot through all these people's bodies. Certainly. It, like I, I also love the uh, editorial that Brett Stevens published a few days ago that was just like a perfect encapsulation of the ruling class's anxiety about the questions people are asking right now about right. the capitalist system. Uh, but these, these people have like a willful myopia right oh definitely uh, like no doubt like i think you hit the nail on the head when you said you know they believe that value is created by magic in the minds of the wealthy and that's where it comes from so in their minds 
it's, you know, it's taking something away from them that you don't have the right to take if you tax it. Whereas, you know, if you believe in the labor theory of value, you understand that all value is created by workers combining their labor with resources. But you don't even have to go to Marx to like understand where Elizabeth Warren's coming from. Right. Because not at all. The government gives your money value. They build the roads, et cetera. Literally. I mean, this is going and this even goes back to I mean, that was a major part of 2008 with that Joe the Plumber schmuck, you know, who was another like little conservative novelty act for a minute. And Obama, you know, running an incredibly moderate policy campaign, just said the obvious fact that everybody knows, hey, if you want to get your plumbing business kickstarted, we're going to need to invest in things. Uh, And that was a big tantrum then, too. People are having a big tantrum about this. Uh, This is AOC at South by Southwest with... um, uh, the pol- senior politics editor at The Intercept, as well as uh, TMBS uh, regular. Do you don't you don't have it? Yes, TMBS regular Brianna Joy Gray. You could see her. I mean, she's she's been on the uh, Michael Brooks show. I mean, maybe ten times. Uh, she's regularly on. Um, and what's so interesting about this is really the fact that. Of course, the right is having a tantrum about this, but a certain type of pundit that is attached to the old make-believe system of let's pretend, you know, let's sit down with somebody like Howard Schultz who has absolutely no political information or understanding. Let's allow him to draw a moral equivalency between Medicare for all and kidnapping children and ripping them out of their out of their arms. This is the you know, the the full pathology of the he said, you know, he said, she said one side, you know, says that two plus two equals uh, five. Maybe I'll even give you let's say it's one off. It's a little bit of a massage. And the other side says two plus two equals four hundred and fifty five thousand. Right. But they're both they both have perspectives. So AOC is going to give a little historical breakdown about Ronald Reagan that is just uh, this this isn't a polemic this is a objective description of the southern strategy and the Reaganite political project and one perfect example I think a perfect example of how special interests and the powerful have pitted white working-class Americans against brown and black working class Americans in order to just screw over all working class Americans um, (laughs) is is Reaganism in the 80s when he started talking about welfare queens. Mm -hmm. So you think about this image, welfare queens, and what he was really trying to talk about was this, he was painting this photo, he was painting this like really resentful vision of essentially uh, black women who were doing nothing that were sucks on our country, right? And it's this whole tragedy of the commons type of thinking, thinking where it's like, because these one, this one specific group of people that you are already kind of subconsciously primed to resent, you give them a, a different reason that's not explicit racism, but still rooted in a racist caricature. Um, it gives people a logical, re- a logical reason to say, oh yeah, no, toss out the whole social safety net. Yeah. And also, uh, Reagan talked, I believe, about the young bucks uh, as well who uh, were, were benefiting from government. Um, Matt. You do a historically uh, focused uh, podcast. Where did Ronald Reagan announce he was running for president in 1980? Where did he choose his launch campaign? Oh, uh, in the Neshoba County County Fair, and I'm blanking on the name of the fir- Philadelphia, Mississippi. Philadelphia, Mississippi, which was, of course, a place where four civil rights uh, workers, people who I had come from the north to help register. Uh, African-American voters and work for the civil rights movement were murdered. At the time, states' rights, particularly in 1980, were a, a 
bare, I mean, just, uh, barely a dog whistle. Every single person knew what you were talking about when you said states' rights because even arch segregationists like Strom Thurmond, that's what they said. It was actually quite rare. Jesse Helms uh, or George Wallace being more at the other end of really coming out and just straight up saying what these people thought and the straight up grotesque bigoted comments. But a lot of the other prime opponents of preserving apartheid in the United States wanted to couch it in genteel rhetoric. And a core part of that genteel rhetoric was states' rights. So Ronald Reagan in 1980 announced he was running for president in a town where civil rights workers were murdered in Mississippi and spoke on states' rights. Again, that it, it, this is an objective comment. <laughs> you know, like, was President Obama a senator from Illinois before he got elected president? Yes. <laughs> Did Ronald Reagan run a white supremacy-based campaign? Yes. And in fact, if you go and look in the 1980s, with some differences, because there was maybe a little bit more, a, although in a much more overall regressive time, there might have been a, a slight more attempt at plausible deniability when he was in the White House. But just like under Trump, you actually saw a, a significant increases in hate group activity and groups like the Klan uh, running sort of in tandem with the Republican Party. And of course, he would go on in addition to using race to divide the electorate and attacking African-Americans in every way possible, including gutting communities and crime legislation and so on. He also would veto a sanctions package targeted at apartheid South Africa, which by the time late in his administration was so controversial that the Senate overrode the veto. And that actually included a handful, a chunk of Republicans. Of course, nothing like that would happen in today's world. So Ronald Reagan is a racist. And what AOC said there should be looked at as, you know, the equivalent of any other politician just having a sort of good, basic understanding of modern U.S. political history. And anybody would tell you otherwise is either living in a fantasy world or is a uh, active agent of racism themselves. A hundred percent. And also this goes back to some of my issues with uh, means testing or even sliding scale. Right. Because one of the things that enabled Ronald Reagan to exploit these resentments and the divisions within the working class was that the, the great society programs were largely means tested and they were not universal. So I think if we're looking to rebuild some sort of social democratic welfare state, um, we want to avoid uh, repeating some of the mistakes of the past, especially considering we can certainly afford to fund universal programs. Definitely. Uh, I found this anonymous quote about this. This is a anonymous Reagan campaign official to the mm -hmm. Washington Post uh, expressing discomfort with the choice of the location says, quote, it would have been like we were coming to Mississippi and winking at the folks here saying we really don't mean to be talking to them urban league folk. Yeah, you're calling from a 847 area code. Who are you? Where are you calling from? Oh, and apparently it was the first campaign stop in the general election, not uh, where he announced, right. but okay. I mean, this is not a, uh, Oh, I mean, that and, makes and, it better. In some respects, it makes it even worse, but I, I, okay. We have that, uh, small correction. Uh, you're calling from an eight, four, seven area code. Who are you? Where are you calling from? Josh from Chicago. Josh from Chicago. What's up? What's on your mind? Uh, first of all, on the Julian Castro thing, he actually does support something close to HR 40. Well, though, does he um, support HR 40 itself? Does he support that bill? If he doesn't, he's being dishonest. Period. Okay, I I, it, I think his definition of reparations is closer than what Kamala Harris is I, and I, Elizabeth Warren. Look, Harris, I'm not going to do work for this guy. Person. This guy has, by the way, and no, not I only know. not only that. If you crap. look at his record in HUD, it was a small no, story in 2016 because there was a lot of other stuff going on, obviously, and he didn't end up being the pick. But progressive groups across the country. We're working to coordinate to make sure that Hillary Clinton did not pick him as a VP because of his atrocious policies at HUD, which absolutely, particularly dealing with housing, obviously, played a huge role 
uh, in the internal racial disparity. So Julian Castro no, is I, totally I full of shit, crap. and I'm not doing any work for him. If he comes out and he supports HR 40, that's fine, but he doesn't, and I don't care what his spin is. Um, okay, so uh, I either um, should I talk about uh, Elizabeth Warren because I saw her speak, or uh, the uh, Ilan Omar Israel stuff. Well, we've covered the, I mean, we, Ilan Omar is great. So how is Elizabeth Warren? So I saw her, so I got a text. I, I donated to her campaign when she announced, uh, cause I didn't know what was going on with whether Bernie was going to run yet or not. Mm -hmm. Um, and, um, I, I do think it's important to have at least if the person Bernie's competing with be a progressive. Okay. Um, and, uh, I, I got a text saying she, there was a meet and greet that she was doing and uh, she wanted to come. And so I went and I met her and she's honestly one of the most like the nicest and genuine, most genuine politicians I've ever met. Cool. Um, and I've met a fair amount of elected officials. Um, and I ended up talking with her about our love of the rock and the past and true, uh, films. Um, but uh, she did say, and this was a, a thing that, she comes across as so genuine. And then someone asked her about Medicare for all at this thing. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I can't remember the specifics. But it was like, it was a woman who like couldn't afford healthcare. She, she, she has healthcare. She couldn't afford to go to the doctor. And she's like, I can't keep on going to the doctor, even though I have like healthcare, these bills are too much. Like, you right. know, what would cost me just for copay. She's like, do you support Medicare for all? And then she said, yes. And then she did the thing that drove me nuts. She equivocated and started talking about defending Obamacare. I think that, and that you know, yeah. Why does she do that? Like, because she doesn't have, you know, Megan Day said this um, when I had her on, and I think it's important. You know, I'm trying to be as ecumenical as possible. I think it's obvious that, of course, I'm 100% on board for Bernie. But I like so and I respect that. Elizabeth Warren, and I'm glad she's in the race, and I think she's putting forward great policies. And Bernie's, by the way, going to, you know, need to to get rid of, you know, go to, get on board getting rid of the filibuster. But it 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 is not. But put it this way: to even fulfill a more um, technocratic, progressive agenda like Elizabeth Warren has, will take actually the same types of bottom-up mobilization that Bernie talks about. And Bernie's the only candidate in the race that seems to understand that if you're going to take on these interests, you need to have a active, relentless, and committed population. And that's another reason why, you know, for me, I'm... Uh, arguments to do with how well somebody administers or understands the bureaucracy are just they couldn't matter less to me because I think that, I mean, obviously within bounds, and I think it goes without saying that Bernie can because he's been a mayor, a congressman, and a senator. So that's, you know, there's obviously a huge amount of basic competence here. But beyond that, there is a, uh, a training to play a certain game that we're not in anymore. And I think that, that it manifests when she, um, you know, doesn't stay clear and firm on something like Medicare for All. I think that she obviously has great policy, great values, and is a great candidate in many respects, but I don't think she thinks of or understands the dynamic of there needs to be a movement uh, and a context and a relentlessness to achieve the types of things she's talking about. Yeah, also she is a liberal. She's a, a good left liberal, but at the end of the day, she's a liberal and she doesn't understand that these are not different versions of the same thing like one requires uh like a real class confrontation and basically the expropriation uh, you know explicitly or implicitly of a large sector of the economy and will be stronger for it and the other one doesn't it doesn't do those things and it's going to be weaker for it and yeah she she still doesn't get that despite the fact that she shows some signs of getting like the immense grassroots power that's going to be required to get either of them but she doesn't and but i don't know but it's disturbing to me frankly just even what she's the thought process on that because the truth of the matter yeah. is, is the lane that she's trying to get you know she's competing i'll just like let's just be in political reality here in 2016 bernie sanders waited 
for Elizabeth Warren to run and was not mm-hmm. only willing to bow out. In fact, all reporting suggests that he wa- he thought she was the better one to go up against Hillary Clinton. She made the decision not to run and Bernie ran. And now Bernie and, I, and it's actually, frankly, surprised me that it surprised this many people. I think that some people, particularly, you know, if they spend too much time online or too much time listening to kind of like a handful of insular pundits, they sort of thought, you know, that there was all these you know, problems, but the reality is, is that he comes out of the, he is the leader. <laughs> he is the prime politician in America of progressive politics. And he's taken that position. He surpassed her with that run. So the only way, you know, or not the only way, but a major part of how she could compete with him in that lane is by not being equivocal about things like Medicare for all. So even just her strategic sense, like is she, if she actually is thinking, I can be a, sort of not clear on that because she's already anticipating ahead. And again, I don't know if this is what she's doing, but if she's already anticipating ahead, either watering it down a message for a general election or even, or even, or my God, like being in Congress and coming up with some technocratic fix, that's just not the mentality that we need right now. Things are too serious no, and too not. critical. And and again, Bernie, sorry, he's the one who gets that. <laughs> and he demonstrates he's it every that. single and day. She, <laughs> you know. But anyways. She also I think yeah. she missed her chance to run in twenty sixteen. I think this was course. the thing. Yeah. At all not, all the Bernie people were organized would have organized for her. Yeah. Definitely. And then she never showed up and all, uh, all of the videos from 2015 and 16 that uh, that this show did me and sam and everybody about bernie sanders would be the same videos except it would be elizabeth warren in the title absolutely yeah uh thanks so much yeah. for the call man appreciate it did you want to break this down matt well no it just kind of goes to what you're talking about about yeah. the matt iglesias said uh, there's so much i agree with Bernie on, but the eschatology, which I don't think he's using that word. I don't think so either. I can look it up. I forget what it actually means, but eschatology of the political revolution really rubs me the wrong way. Isn't that the end of the world? There's something, yeah, it's something like that. Um, Iglesias isn't using it right. Um, But it's weird to not get that at this point, to get what Bernie's talking about with the political revolution. It is very weird. And it's very weird, too, by the way, for Especially because Iglesias is trying to be a Bernie bro now. He's trying to be a Bernie bro, and he's also somebody who came up under Obama. Yeah. And Obama absolutely, in a, you know, in a, in a obviously with totally different politics, um, you know, we emphasize correctly the amount of, you know, corporate money and so on that Obama got. But part of his insurgency against Hillary Clinton was having people like Marshall Gans who organized with Cesar Chavez teach people how to go door to door and community organize. Like that was a major part of what Obama did. Yeah. So eschatology is the part of theology concerned with death judgment and the final destiny of the soul and of humankind. Well, if uh, you know, I don't your healthcare sounds about right. Or if he means that he specifically names like the CEO of United health, I totally disagree. I think that's great that Bernie does that. Well, it is true that revolution has a certain, uh, a very, a very, I don't know, it's a, it's, it's a very big word. It's got a certain ring to it that not everybody's on board with. But that's why it's a political revolution, right? He's a democratic socialist. Um, I think someone needs to teach uh, Matt Iglesias the difference between a political revolution and a social revolution. Yep, exactly. Listen up, Matty boy. You're calling from a 214 area code. Who are you? Where are you calling from? 214, are you there? Nope. You're calling You're calling from a 9... Well, I am trying 914 now. That was 214, but you're 914. What's on your mind? What's your name? Uh, 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 I think you got uh, Grimlock right here. And... Um, my question is simple. Um, what's it going to take for us to have general strikes in this country? Um, because that it. seems to me to be the only thing to, that'll really bring about change is shutting the whole system down. Well, I don't agree with and, that. Uh, I think getting somebody like Bernie, I think, 
Uh, first of all, I think even smaller scale strikes are already having huge effects on the country, like the teacher strikes. And I think huge. getting huge, getting somebody like Bernie elected or getting specifically Bernie elected would have very big effects. But I would love to see a general strike, and I have no idea how that happens or what that ta or what takes place. I mean, I, again, I'm not at all interested in valorizing the French. Uh, and the yellow vest movement is super, is super complicated and I've covered it and it's great and there's problematic tendencies, blah, blah, blah. But on a super basic level, I mean, it's amazing that they pretty much are just like, no, sacre bleu. And I don't know why no. Americans don't have that. We, no. we, we could use a hell of a well, lot more of it. I think no we're doubt. starting to relearn Thanks it for the call. a little bit. Um, we saw the strike that ended the government shutdown or helped to end it. I hope it doesn't take as long as it did last time, the next time. Uh, also, the hope is for leftists who support Bernie that even just having a president in office who doesn't oppose things like strikes will empower the working class to recognize their power and like do those kinds of actions more and more. Well, and also think you have someone like Bernie, you have Bernie in office, it's an offensive strike. It's pretty wild it's to not think just about like, that. Yeah, to think about like even e like, uh, I don't like, know they're striking. Like, I can't like, compromise. Like, but he's gonna feel pressured to accede to their demands way more. Like, it's almost to a wild degree more than any previous president. Like, it's it's well, almost it's hard another, to even think about. Great that. argument. Well, on the him. one hand, yeah. like Megan Day said, in order to get anything done in office, he's gonna have to rely on bottom up Definitely. movements 100%. because he doesn't have a whole lot of allies through these kinds of programs. On the other hand, you know he is in charge of a very uh, essentially conservative system. He's in charge. He's the head of U.S. empire. And um, he might be forced in some instances to try to restore order when it threatens the foundations of, you know, the system. And we have seen that a little bit with AMLO in Mexico, unfortunately, engaging in some strike breaking activities down there, despite the fact that some of these strikes may have been empowered by having a less corrupt more sock damned kind of president. So it's like a bit of a double-edged sword. It's definitely a double-edged sword. It does um, heighten the contradictions. It heightens though. the contradictions. But I mean, that's that's the other point too, is it's like you're much less likely if the situation in Mexico breaks to the significant left and outpaces AMLO, it's because AMLO's president. That could not happen in the previous leadership. Um. And that and that's where my arguments, you know, come in when people from the left sometimes misread where I'm coming from. It's not that I'm like, oh, well, that's the be all end all top down. So you need baby. to understand it's the context step. in which there's a much greater likelihood. So as I because like I just said, I want to see people strike in the United States like, yes, it's amazing. And of course, the strike was a major reason that we canceled the government shutdown and teachers are winning some concessions. But I want to see a strike that's like on offense i want to see a strike that's like well this is the medicare for all strike and we're doing this because we want a clean no bullshit bill uh the jai paul bill is great in the house we want that voted in the senate and then we want it on the president sanders desk now that's it done 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 socialism here in america yes that's what i'm saying hell yeah um let's let's actually play one more clip <laughs> I want to play this Mehdi Hassan with Eric Prince clip. Uh, you know, I've said a lot. We've all said a lot that it's much more profitable to look at. Don't get fixated with Russia. Um, don't not acknowledge, you know, Russian oligarchs either. Obviously, people are way too fixated on Russia. Just don't when, nationalize it to Russia. Yeah, don't nationalize. Yeah, this is an oligarch problem. This is a corruption problem. This is a global influence uh, peddling problem. And one of the most disturbing and sick parts of the Trump relationship is a resurrection of a Bush era figure, Eric Prince. Uh, this is somebody, you know, Jeremy Scahill wrote Blackwater. That's great a book. Horrifying, great book about this global mercenary firm which should be illegal uh and their conduct in afghanistan and iraq their private element of the u.s empire and murder of civilians across the globe and eric prince is connected to bannon to trump he's the brother 
of Betsy DeVos, that horror show in charge of our uh, education department. And in charge of 10 yachts. And Right, exactly. Um, and for some reason, he agreed to sit down with Mehdi Hassan. Uh, Mehdi Hassan is a very good interviewer. And whether he just, is, I'll plug it again, you got to listen to the interview he just did with Cornell West. Cornell West is absolutely... <laughs> I don't think I've ever said it this unequivocally before. Cornell West is absolutely the best public intellectual in America. I, I period. I no one is in that realm. Uh, so please listen to that interview. Here's Mehdi Hassan grilling the absolute opposite of uh, moral of uh, Cornell West, just the complete moral dregs of civilization. Eric Prince on whether or not he lied in congressional testimony about a Trump Tower meeting in 2016. I certainly uh, disclosed any uh, any meetings. The very very not few the, I had. Not in the congressional testimony you gave to the House. We went through it. You didn't mention anything about August 2016 meeting in Trump Tower. I they did. specifically asked you what context you have, and you didn't answer that. Uh, I don't believe I was asked that question. You were asked were there any communi formal communications or contact with the campaign. You said apart from writing papers, putting up yard signs. No. <laughs> That's what you said. <laughs> I've got the transcript of the conversation here. Sure. I mean, I might have been, uh, I, I think I was at Trump headquarters or the campaign headquarters. Trump maybe, Town, uh, August 3rd, 2016. You, possible. an Israeli dude, a back channel to the Emiratis and the Saudis, Don Jr., we're Stephen there, Miller. We're there to talk about Iran policy. You're we're there to talk about Iran policy. Mm -hmm. oh, Don't you think that's something important to disclose to the House Intelligence Committee while you're under oath? I did. You didn't. We just went through the testimony. There's no mention <laughs> of the Trump Tower meeting in August 2016. Why not? I don't know if they got the transcript wrong. <laughs> Oh, they got the transcript wrong. So if we go, I, I, I don't know. I remember. I remember uh, certainly. Dis discussing I mean, this is a problem for you because we know that Robert Mueller he hasn't been able to establish collusion yet, but he has got a lot of guys for lying to the authorities and not telling the whole truth. Is that a problem now? That even if you accidentally didn't tell them, that could come back and haunt you. I fully cooperated. And I haven't heard anybody. I haven't heard from anybody in more than nine months. Pray to God. I'm. I'm not. I am so, I'm, it's funny because sometimes I, I have desires that certain things happen to certain people that I will not say publicly on air, but in general, I am not, I'm really not a punitive guy, but I'm very much like a remove from society because of danger they pose if yes. need be. And if ever there was a person that needed to just be, I mean, taken <laughs> off of the playing field because of just the fundamentally dangerous and unacceptable world they play from here to the emirates to afghanistan to iraq to new business in china it would be eric prince and yeah. if we don't get this global system under control if we don't come to a new way of doing things he is a prototype of the future yeah there's something very chilling about a guy will just say yeah the transcript's probably wrong that's like that's yeah. taking fake news to an entirely no another level it's like truth is just a function of your alliances, basically. Hundred power. Uh, Brooklyn bartender. My uh, Bill Maher said on the show that Palestinians are indeed the victims of Palestine, not Israel. Thoughts? How to respond to this, I, dude? I, I mean, look, Bill Maher has been saying dumb nonsense about the Middle East his whole career. He has no idea what he's talking about. Um, I think. Okay, I think that he, to the extent I have any sympathy, and I always say this, he's in his 60s and it's like the same reason he still thinks that like smoking pot makes him edgy and you know he but but no in all seriousness like look if you grew up if you were born in the 50s or late 40s the holocaust is a couple years out so i understand uh, the emotional trigger his political and historical and moral understanding is less than nothing and this is an old, you know, Ballywick, which is like the Palestinians are oppressed by Palestine. So first you can answer it with like, well, who kills the vast preponderance of Palestinians? It's obviously the Israeli government with white phosphorus and drones and shelling and all sorts of indiscriminate uh, civilian killings. Then you could say in the West Bank, in fact, the West Bank Palestinian leadership is certainly... Uh, you know, they're repressive if you criticize the leadership as an example, but they're essentially just subcontractors for the Israelis. The Israelis control the West Bank in every real substantive way. And then in Gaza, yeah, they elected Hamas. And, uh, you know, if you speak to a Palestinian, including Palestinians who loathe uh, Hamas or the Palestinian Authority, they will always say to you, 
nothing can be done or even thought about until you end the Israeli blockade and the Israeli occupation. So that, and in the positive sense, that's the type of comment that like, it's very interesting to me because I, I remember particularly with this issue, like people would say stuff like that several years ago and it wouldn't have any controversy. And now it's almost like we skipped a step and people are like, can you believe Bill Maher has been saying this? And it's like, yeah, he said thousands of things like this. It's just now people are getting more, uh, you know, just less ridiculous and delusional about the issue. We'll play it on TMBS tomorrow night. But I, I actually had a real debate on Israeli TV in the sense that I was up against like an actual guy with chops, not like, you know, usually they're like, Michael, you're up against a ham radio operator in uh, Missouri who likes Trump. But this guy, you know, edits a news, some, some Zionist oriented newspaper. He's got an accent. He knows what he's doing. But it's all just cliches. It's all smears. It's all cliches. It's all appeals to authority. They don't have any answer. And the, funnily enough, the old chestnut that they would do like, well, why don't you, you know, criticize the Saudis or the Emiratis? And the answer is really funny because it's like, well, first of all, we do. Anybody who is going to be critical of Israel is the most likely person to criticize the U.S. relationship with the Saudi regime. And then secondly, like I said in this interview, I was like, I thought you wanted to be held to a higher standard. I mean, very few people have any pretensions of what Saudi Arabia is. Saudi Arabia is a bu brutal monarchy and theocracy. <laughs> Israel is an apartheid state posing as a democracy. And that's the problem. But, uh, okay, you're calling from an 814 area code. Who are you? Where are you calling from? Hey, guys. My name is uh, AJ. I'm from Erie, PA, but I'm actually calling from New Orleans. Hey, AJ. Well, that sounds fun. What's on your mind, man? Oh, not much. Um, I'm actually, I hope this isn't a too big problem. I'm calling, this is a feelings-based call, not a fact-based call. Okay. Um, but That's what we encourage. Uh, yeah, you had we mentioned, like uh, Yeah, fuck, fuck facts. <laughs> uh, it's not, uh, you had mentioned the uh, uh, projection, Sandy Hook projection on the Republican thing, and that kind of struck a chord with me just because I'm from Erie, and if you remember the uh, Catholic priest bust that happened a couple months ago, <laughs> the priest that actually was the whistleblower was from my old church up there in Erie, PA. Okay. I don't, I don't know this story at all, sadly, to be honest with you, but. Oh, um, oh, there, oh, oh, it's not, oh, it, it was just like a whole, like, um, leak of a whole bunch of Catholic priests, uh, you know, molesting children, okay. mostly boys, and it was, right. uh, totally Same. buried. Um, yeah, and it, and I connected mm -hmm. only to the projection Sandy Hook thing because, uh, and the feelings thing, because, all my old eerie friends, the reason why I moved away, are still so locked into, like, the Sandy Hook conspiracy or anything Gavin McGinnis or Alex Jones would say. And yesterday, one of them posted a picture on their Instagram just of a gun on his floor talking about the upcoming war. And it's just Jesus the scariest Christ. time. So I guess in, yeah, as a way of a productive question, how do you talk to old friends? Do you not? I know kind of the mode right, right now is just these people are not like. You well, can't let me, talk let me just say, let me just so say this real, real quick. I don't, when I joke about like, yeah, oh, please. don't talk to your friends. Like your friends are your friends. So I, I, it's very, I find it, it's kind of awkward to be honest. Cause I have no, you choose who you want to be friends with and what, you know, like, there's no answer to that. All I'm saying to you is oh, oh, I don't think, yeah, you know, yeah. so I think you be friends with whoever the hell you want to be friends with. And there's a, and that's a complicated oh, totally, yeah. thing. I, I choose, but in terms of like, in terms of like how you the, persuade yeah. somebody who is mm -hmm. sharing like a photo like that, uh, that's not going to happen through rational persuasion. It's not. And yeah, sometimes, you know, you can give it a shot. Other times, uh, you know, I, I, I look. I'm at a loss. I don't know that that and because also that type of extreme is not something. I'll be blunt. I mean, I'm exposed. There's some things that are that are complicated, but I'm not exposed to that, man. Oh yeah, I don't. In, I don't know anybody. I don't know people who are moving Real like quick, that. Real quick, I yeah. yeah. I definitely listen to you guys for like policy and awesome stuff, not for, you know, what to do with my friendship stuff. Um, that's why I said this is feelings. You guys are great. Um, Sorry going through it though. a lot. For real. Thank Keep you. Up Thanks brother. Appreciate they, the call. They, they were talking about that on Chapo recently too. Like 
uh, you cutting someone off is not going to change their politics. No, it's not. Um, it's like, I guess it's a matter of, you know, your preference, what you want to deal with in your life, which is totally a personal choice, which I respect either way you make it. But uh, yeah, I think a lot of us probably have either family members or friends from an earlier time in our lives whose politics are pretty bad. I know I've got one. Uh, Sean's got one who supports Trump. And like it, it, it's totally a personal choice. I'm not I'm not going to make any more friends like that but I'm not going to cut someone off who's otherwise still a good friend or valuable relationship because they've got the wrong politics. Right. And I mean, and you know, there's a lot of ways to, to, to judge people. Like Maddie, if they're an right. asshole in other ways, that's well, different. Yeah. Hope, all right. We should end soon. I don't, that sounds kind of bad. Um, all yeah, right. I we're going to take okay. a final call. And then a few more IMs, then we're out of here. Uh, you're calling. Sorry. Let's see. Sorry. Fuck. I know I. Sorry, I hung up on somebody. I apologize. Call back tomorrow. I'm sorry. You're calling from a plus 491 area code. Who are you? Where are you calling from? Hello? Hello. Hello. Hello, you're on. What's up? Um, I was going to talk about Stacey Abrams being the perfect VP candidate for Bernie. Okay, great. She's a great candidate. I, I would either her... I actually, I got to admit, from being reminded of Nina Turner just in terms of like... Nina Turner's an incredibly gifted campaigner. Uh, but Stacey Abrams would be up there for me too, no doubt. Especially since she's accepted by the establishment from the Democrats. All right. Thanks for the call, and, man. Um, sorry. I thought that was what you had. I apologize. Matt, are you all right? Yeah, just getting over a cold. Okay. All right. Let's do a few IMs and then we got to go. Uh, David Cotter, I don't, you got to, I don't know the first four digits of your number i don't understand that i can't take your call if i don't know the first four digits of your number um dr chaos md back from vacation that included a political break but one of the places i went was a civil rights museum in greenboro north carol greensboro north carolina that was very powerful and being from a state like oregon we don't have a history that exists on the east coast and the south don't get me wrong we have our own racist past to deal with here oh you sure do but to learn about the history in some of these pivotal locations for civil rights is very eye-opening. Definitely recommend that people go to these places to learn about the troubling, inspiring history of this country. Also, the amount of intergenerational wealth denied to from African Americans is something that this country needs to address, without a doubt. There should be more of that. If you're thinking about uh, what to do this summer, you want to plan some sort of trip, go to some sort of historical site that you should be at. Right. Go to that stuff. Right. HTX Farmer, thank you, amazing MR crew. Any reparations really need to be accompanied by some form of truth and reconciliation <laughs> commission, which publicly lays out the horrors of indigenous genocide and slavery. I, I really agree with that. And I, cause I think that on some level, yeah, I agree with that. I think that some part of that whole, um, it, it's that type of cultural process is really important too. Now it's dangerous because that's how David Brooks is coming out for it while still being somebody who wants to do nothing in terms of a real policy for America. So it's a dialectic. But I do think that things like truth and reconciliation commissions actually are very important. Um, let me take one final call. You're calling from a 248 area code. Who are you? Where are you calling from? This is me. Yeah, it's you. What's up? Oh, hey. Uh, did you see Tulsi Gabbard's... Um town hall yesterday i, I was no. really disappointed um she didn't really give direct answers to a lot of things um i think she gave a good medicare for all answer if i remember i thought that the host was really confrontational also um i, I want to just say i will say this and i think my criticisms of tulsi gabbard are very well established and some things like you know 
the connections to the extreme far right government in India are, are just a fundamental problem to me in the same way right. that, you know, Kamala Harris's criminal record is a fundamental problem or Joe Biden's everything record is a fundamental problem. But I will say that I, the double standard applied to Tulsi Gabbard is really starting to annoy me because yeah. I see candidates who it it's a good test case and what is and isn't acceptable. So even like the Assad thing, which is absolutely not acceptable to me, it's very problematic and really disturbing. But like, you know, politicians have taken junkets from all sorts of governments. Now, again, not ones committing the crimes Assad is committing, but also not ones in the same sort of, you know, dynamic. And I, you know, I, I don't know. I just, I, I find... When she's been right on Venezuela, she's right on Medicare for all, she's right on marijuana, she's right on, you know, any number of issues. Now, I will not be supporting her. I will not be voting for her. And and I find people who brush the incredibly disturbing things about her record and things That's in terms of refugees and Assad and, and India, I, I fundamentally yeah. disagree with. And at the same time, there's a there is clearly a big double standard applied to her. Uh, which is starting to annoy me. Yeah, I mean, with the Hindu nationalist thing that annoyed me last night, is she's just so disingenuous. She said that it was because of um, like racism and bigotry against uh, Hindus, which Hindus. is, I mean, that's just obviously a lie. She knows that's not true. Well, I don't know. I'm, I'm I don't know if that's I'm not. Talking. I mean, again, I don't. That's but that's the tricky thing, right? Like, is it? Well, I mean, do you some... do criticize her for that. No, I you of course I don't, but right it's like the same thing with Israel, right? Like, is there a huge problem with support of a regime in Israel? Of course. And is there, I mean, and obviously not in Ilan Omar's case and, and certainly not in my case, but there is also anti-Semitism. So there's definitely some element where her, well, that's a good example, right? Her connections with the Hindu far right should not be considered. I mean, they should be considered fundamentally disqualifying and problematic. But as would should all the candidates, including Warren and Harris, other than Bernie, frankly, and frankly, including uh, Gabbard herself, mostly going to APAC and saying, you guys can do whatever the hell you want is disqualifying. Right. So, again, I'm not saying it because there's real innate problems with her, but the double standards are are a bit much that that's yeah, where i'm kind of coming in on but i mean i you know there's a reason i didn't watch the town hall right I, but frankly i didn't watch any of them i'm not particularly you know i don't yeah you i don't anything. need to see buddha jag or whatever and i and my god i do not need to see whatever that third guy was i don't even remember his name i mean that's just like fucking ridiculous and and yeah. it's also ridiculous frankly though that all three of them had to share one night when howard schultz got his own thing Tulsi Gabbard, Peter Buttigieg, and whoever that congressman whose name I'm forgetting in, all are more That's important. Yeah, Tim. They're all yeah. more important than Howard Schultz. So, anyways. But, right. Yeah, yeah. More percent. But thanks for the call. No, I appreciate it, man. Thanks a lot. Uh, appreciate it. Look, I'm still, still not a supporter. I'm still going to maintain the critique, but I just think it's... For certain issues, it's nice to have somebody in there saying the right things about certain she's issues. Out of the head on Venezuela. She's out of the head on on drugs. She's out of head on sex work. She's good on you know Medicare for all. She's good on certain environmental things. This is about the ideas. And right. And then when you start to sort of say like, well, here are the areas where she's really fundamentally problematic. Well, that same metric would apply to almost all the other candidates. And then there's this huge you know, disparity in how she's talked about. So I'm not, you know, I'm not. And then of course, you know, there's a weird sort of sub pocket cult about her. So it's hard to cover, but I've adjusted accordingly because she's mostly been saying good things. She's continues to maintain some ridiculous positions, but she's also said some very good things and she's definitely getting, you know, when she was on the view, I thought some of what she said about Syria and Assad is absolutely wrong and disturbing to me. 
But the broader context of that clip is basically her saying, we don't need to be constantly intervening and interfering with other governments. And the, and the woman on The View looking at her like that was a crackpot statement. It's not. She's 100% right. And why, incidentally, is she drilled on every little thing when we have photos of John McCain hanging out with people affiliated with Nazis and he's called for supporting every type of regime imaginable and bombing everywhere imaginable. So I'm tired of the double standard. Keep yes, it I, simple. I'm Keep sure that simple. that will satisfy 100% of the <laughs> Tulsi stands who constantly accuse us of being unfair to her. It will not satisfy them and it will piss a whole bunch of other people off. But, Welcome you know, back into the do? fold, those of you who are satisfied with that. You should, I mean, honestly, if you're, that's, that's the best you're going to get because I'm not going to overlook the stuff that really is a problem. Come on, Michael, bend the knee right. to Tulsi. <laughs> if you get me in a, in a, in a, crazy hypothetical which i don't do because i'm not harris but when you the real question would be like the who do you break for it's you know tulsi versus uh well actually frank i could tell you tulsi versus biden tulsi definitely so maybe that isn't even that hard but that's a shit <laughs> that is a real shitty yeah, scenario no don't speak that into being bernie's the front runner don't worry about it Bernie but is the front runner. We have some. We have a correction to make. Okay. So I'm going to play the audio that we have to that we commented on first, just so you get an idea. All right. I used to say, Tim, you got to start doing it over here, and you really have. I mean, you've really uh, put a big investment in our country. We appreciate it very much, Tim Apple. Okay, Tim Apple. Now uh, Trump has since tweeted about this incident. He said, uh, "Let's see if I can find the actual one." Um, oh yeah, here it is. He says. On it up here. Uh, at, a, at a recent roundtable meeting of business executives, and long after formally introducing Tim Cook of Apple, I quickly <laughs> referred to Tim plus Apple as Tim slash Apple <laughs> as an easy way to save time and words. The fake news was disparagingly <laughs> all over this, and it became yet another bad Trump story. Yeah, you gotta conserve point. your energy. Wow. Yes. Well, I guess we stand corrected. Thank you very much, Michael <laughs> Majority. <laughs> Michael Majority. Michael Lemar, thank you. Michael Lemar, thank you. Well, that's why I named my show after myself. So it's I Michael never, Podcast. I never got into <laughs> Michael YouTube, thank you. Thanks for the correction. John McCain's ghost is a former senator from Arizona. You think I'd be used to dry heat? I mean, this place is hotter than the. All right. All right. And the final, final I am of the day. It's kind of trick, uh, kind of uh, targeted map. Bring it. No, not in a bad way. Jay Cool, have you heard about the power outages going on in Venezuela? I'm not as conspiratorial as Matt, but it seems very coincidentally based on the timing. I will say that I know that Venezuela has been dealing with power shortages for quite some time, and again, there's self generated that they existed before. It does strike me as weird timing. And also the idea of Marco Rubio tweeting about it when he didn't do a goddamn thing for Puerto Rico, it was out of power for 11 months, is mind-blowing. Yeah, Puerto Rico is the key word there. Keep it simple. All right, we'll see you tomorrow. It might take all the strength I got To get to where I want But I know somehow I'm gonna get there I wasn't looking when I just got caught Between the truth and the light bar But finding out won't make me feel any better Yeah, I know the clock is ticking But the meds are gonna kick in And my pilot light shining bright I guess I'm where the choice is Option where you don't get paid for the road that bends before it finally breaks you. I guess I may have lost my drive between the 101 and the 5. Do you know how far the detour takes you? Yeah, I know the clock is ticking, but the meds are gonna kick in. My pilot light shining bright.
fading. 